You need this? I don't know whether you do. Man, I usually Ask don't. Like, no, no, I know how to do this. For but. the recording, uh, it's better use the microphone. The mic, oh, for the recording, so better I do. Yes. Okay, then you can Prova. hide. You Prova. Daniel? Daniela, she will come tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, too. But you can introduce her. If you do. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Okay, so I believe that we should uh, we should begin, and uh, hopefully the house will be complete soon. So. Welcome to the second week of, uh, I believe that somehow in the poster it was written for fusion application, but the college is a little bigger than that. It's a little bit of physics. The first week I devoted to fusion, and this week we will be talking much more about the general physics applied. Uh, Okay. And perhaps there will be greater emphasis on, not perhaps, definitely greater emphasis on theory and simulation. 
And let me introduce the actors main actors in this uh, week. So Professor Daniel Dennis. Um, nice meeting you all. Yes. And uh, he will be he's again uh, one of my students at ICT. Long time ago. Yeah. When did you come from? Longer than we want to remember. That. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, Sergio Sergio, who's studying at the University of Calabria. And then we have Lena Habib, she's coming from Paris. And we have David Hatch there in the He's hiding himself from the room. Uh, and, uh, and David is uh, is uh, in addition to everything else, he's a big athlete at the University of Texas and uh, is one of the, the leaders in modern computing and data mechanics. And um, all of these people are leaders in their respective fields. So I believe we are going to hear a lot. And um, um, this week, you will see less of me and more of Daniel. Okay? But I'm there, available. Anything you people want. And we want um, to have some session in which you want your uh, doubts on something to be removed or some additional. Uh, instruction or some new thing that you hear, uh, do not ask it to come in front. Okay, all right. Okay. okay. So, we'll, we are ready to start this session this morning. We are going to have a, a search of a video from Calabria. Uh, he will be giving the, his first talk in a couple minutes. Then we'll have a coffee break, and after the coffee break, we'll have the Second stop. And uh, after him, uh, Lina Habib will have the first stop this morning. So that, that will be, that resumes our morning session. Then uh, remember that it is afternoon at 2 p.m. or from 2 p.m. until 5 something p.m. Yeah. with a coffee break. With a coffee break in between, uh, we'll have a poster session. So please come down first with your coffee. No, actually, the coffee, I mean, I'm sure there will be coffee break here. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But they can continue. Them. Yeah, but I, what, what I want to, what I remind you is to bring your posters <laughs> as soon as possible so that they will be there by the end. And that will be for today. The there is a cocktail. There is there is some some pop, cocktail. Uh, um, uh, they they are students are there. Okay. okay. So that that pretty much resumes our session today. So well, let me introduce, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sergio Servidio from the University of Calabria. Uh, he will talk to us about kinetic models, kinetic models in space plasma programs. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Professor Jan, for, this, uh, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious school. I'm very honored to be here, and I will try to do my best. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sorry to interrupt. This. Yeah, I think so. Uh, recording. Oh, it's already recording. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yes. So you got my interruption. No, no, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, please, this is an example of you should how you should interrupt me constantly. Okay. No, no, that's not true. And you stop. Okay, anytime. So, in this. Okay. Oh, got it. So, um, this course is, is going to be divided in uh, three parts. We will do really in a Galilean way. First, we observe things. We will look at the observations, see how the space plasma looks like, and then uh, extract features and think in the way we will like to model it. So, observation first, always in our hand, right? We look at the uh, data, the real data, then we will go back and think about the questions and then we start we start from scratch in the first part of the course we will start really from scratch i will introduce you the basic really tools to do a simulation codes i mean really a blank <laughs> piece of paper and we do like program blah 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 okay uh, of course 
we will not have time to do a real numerical course on this, right? But the, we, I would like to show you ju just the basic tools and then we will jump very fast from the basic tools. We will build the code. We will simulate the astrophysical plasmas, okay? This will be the pretty much the first part. In the second part, we will go, we will go more into the observation, really observe, we will observe the simulation and compare one-to-one -one with, with the uh, spacecraft analysis, okay? This is uh, really the main, uh, uh, the, main, the main thing we will do through all uh, of the presentation. And then uh, in the third part, we will uh, uh, learn something about the solar wind and export it to plasmas that very far away, like supernova remnants, black holes. And we will conclude with objects that are plasmas that are very, very far away. So basically we start from observation in the solar wind and the solar wind is a nice laboratory. It's a prototype to understand stellar winds, right? And then we'll, thanks to our model, we will try to extract information on, the, on other objects. So in this first part, I will uh, really show the main properties of the spacecrafts. And then uh, I will introduce the numerical te techniques. We will uh, use both uh, fluid models. That's, that's the field where I come from. I come from hydrodynamics, I'm an hydro guy. But then we realized in solar wind that really uh, you need, uh, of course, a magnetic field. Then you need the magnetohydrodynamic to describe it, or maybe all MHD. But then we, we, we realized that really the plasma is not really so collisional. There are a lot of collisionless effect, and therefore we need like kinetic models to simulate, to understand some features, not all of them. Most of them can be interpreted via MHD, for example. But if you want to understand fully the small scale termination of, of turbulence, then I would argue that you need the, a full self-consistent kinetic model. Uh, okay. In the third part, we will go from global to local simulation. What does it mean? Well, when there is a weather forecast, uh, for example, there is large simulation of the Earth, okay? And then you need to know a Coriolis force, the impact of like, you need to know a lot of in ingredients, right? Then uh, this, the computer passes local information to other, other modeling, other, another higher level, refined level of simulation. So you simulate smaller domains with more, uh, physics. Uh, that's what we will do. We look first at the global heliosphere uh, with via MHD global simulation, and then we will do local simulations of turbulence. Because with local simulation of turbulence, you can really go to high resolution, extract the maximum of information thanks to simulation. Okay, that will be our it will be a weather forecast for <laughs> for the heliosphere. So, what is a plasma? A plasma is a ionized gas. I guess where uh, charged particles really interact in a very complex way via electromagnetic force forces. Uh, most of the universe, as you know, is uh, in this uh, state of very ionized uh, charged particles. And uh, but observation are somehow limited. We wish we can observe everything in a plasma. We try in the heliosphere with missions, but really you can probe small pieces and have only certain details, or by looking by at imaging, you can extract some other uh, information. What is certainly true is that most of this plasma here is highly collisionless. Apart of some regions like the lower corona, where there are some friction like, and the collisionality is high, but if you consider the amount, the volume of the universe is mostly uh, collisionless. It means that the, the, the density is so low that really, uh, particle do not collide and therefore this will have a, a strong consequences on the modeling. Okay, this is a really the good time if you want to enter space physics is really the good time to do it because there is a tremendous amount of data today It's the golden age of <laughs> space physics. There are this is just is a, is, is a, is a partial uh, covering of spacecraft that today are uh, or the past flight uh, around the Earth at one astronomical units, or closer to the sun with the new missions no, now like Solar Orbiter and Parker Solar Probe. Many other here we have people involved in missions, and uh, there is a lot, um, a lot more going on. For example, there are very exciting uh, uh, space missions now going uh, close to the sun 
but uh, uh, in the future, uh, by using other techniques like Helio Swarm, they will have like constellation of, of like CubeSat, CubeSat of data to extract information about magnetic field and particles. Now we will see why in a little. So really there is a, a very large amount of data in some other projects. Uh, we do study this amount of data, even using uh, uh, artificial intelligence to extract information, for example, because it's really, you need to mime a lot of, of, of features from a very large databases, but you have to be uh, careful with that because there, maybe there is an overcrowding of information coming from this, right? So you have to select a few things that you are interested in. And uh, this is the solar wind, you see? There, there is a shiny, happy sun, which is emitting the, the, the wind. And the solar wind speed at one astronomical unit is very fast, uh, like 500 to 700 kilometers per second. So it's very fast. And uh, this is very important because uh, if you look into a river flow and the flow is going very fast and you look at the river for while it's going through your camera, if you measure in a point, of um, uh, uh, the flow and the flow is going very fast on average, then you can apply that you can apply the Taylor frozen in hypothesis. It means that any signal in time is a picture of the signal in space. Okay, because if the fluctuation level is very small compared to the mean flow, it's not really varying while it passes through. So any time recording, it's a picture of what is happening in space. Condition, this can be seen for you know for whichever point we choose. Yes. So it can be it, it can there can be infinite number of uh, points in that figure. Yes, absolutely. But you, essentially, you go to here, and uh, you have a probe here, a satellite, and this is like a fluctuation going very fast here, with this uh, v zero much bigger than delta v, and this is like delta v. Hmm? If this condition is verified, then each time sequence, this time here, this is my time arrow, can be transformed into a, actually it's going the other way because there is a mirror effect. If you think a little bit about that, it's not immediate. Is a, a, You have like a, an image in space, okay? If you, you record the time series here, then it's so fast, it's not, it's frozen. Assume you are, it's frozen, it's not exact, it's, an, an, it's a, a, an approximation. Then you are like extracting a piece of space, 1D. Okay? Well, this is a very important uh, point on this because, because if you do this and you measure time series, then you are extracting little slices through your turbulent setting. This is really true also in uh, engineer hydrodynamics, and uh, it's, it's very old hydrodynamic thing, right? Can be proven that is correct. Uh, then you, if you measure the magnetic field as a function of time, this will be the magnetic field as a function of space. And here we have a magnetic and velocity field. You see, you, we measure in the solar wind really, uh, I wish it worked, but it doesn't. So that, okay, that, that doesn't, if you're okay, okay. okay. In the meantime, I will continue here because uh, here we have V and B. The first thing you see is that it's really highly fluctuating. It's like random, it looks random. The second thing you see is that they are really uh, aligned and uh, therefore there is a coupling between the magnetic and the velocity field. So this is telling you that your velocity and magnetic field are not really the couple. Probably there are some physics principle that make them like aligned. And this is the typical of alphanic turbulence where there are correlation between velocity and magnetic field. So if you do the power spectrum then on both, you will see a nice thing that uh, the energy as a function of frequency, uh, careful now because frequency, it means K vectors. So the energy as a function of K really decreases fast and there is a power law. When physicists see power laws, we become really excited. Okay, because it means that there is a law behind which is regulating that, that flux. And here the idea, we will see it in a moment, here is like, there is an analogy with hydrodynamic and the slope was like five minus five thirds. This is really something well known. So from observation really, this is very old observation, you see from the sixties from Mariner Explorer. Uh, from this old observation, we extract that the field is very uh, random like, 
there is alignments between velocity and magnetic field that are like wave-like activity. And there is a power law spectra at different, uh, the, the energy is distributed over different, a broad range of scales with a power law, three things. So probably there's turbulence, structures, and waves. Uh, this is a very old picture that probably you have seen already, if you are familiar with, uh, with turbulence. The, end, the idea is that if I, ever, if I shake my coffee in the morning, okay, and I shake it fast, uh, I will see the, I will, I'm injecting energy from the large scales, which is like my steering scales. And my steering scales are this one. And the, the vortices couple and produce smaller vortices. And then eventually this goes on, uh, vortex splits into two and so on, until you reach uh, dissipative scales where friction above, between molecules is, is happening. This is typical, the typical uh, Richardson turbulent cascade where you inject energy at one scale and it goes down at small scales and is uh, ubiquitous, is a universal process. Uh, no matter how th this process is, is very universal, it can, be, it can be in fluids, plasmas, or other uh, media. Uh, in particular, with this, in this phenomenology, in the framework of this phen phenomenology, you can uh, predict from uh, hydrodynamics that the K vector, the, the energy among scale is the, distributed with a power like K to minus five thirds. So there is a, a power law, which is really well observed. If you write, you Google it, K to minus five thirds will be in hydrodynamics, plasmas, in helium, in wherever. So of course it's much more rich than this, but the calculation when I do it to my students, it takes will be one hour, the, the hypothesis, they may take three, four lessons before you arrive to that. But the calculation is very basic, right? It's something like on time, time scales and can be obtained very easily. If you are interested, then maybe in a break and someone of you is interested to revise this classical result from Kolmogorov. So, yes? Why not? Uh, so that they understand that what assumption goes. That's an exact. So they, they will have a better understanding that when they're dealing with the plasma, then can they expect satisfaction? Absolutely. And then they should come. This is crucial because then if you learn the way that you obtain this law, maybe one day measuring something different with another time scale, you can obtain your law. Okay. And this is my wish for the students, right? That's a PhD. Students, that's, that, that's the purpose. But Okay, suppose I, uh, I do in a hydrodynamic, I pump some turbulence from the, a sphere, okay, like the sun, and this turbulence is going away. So uh, if uh, the medium is adiabatic, temperature will decrease like power, like minus R to minus five thirds with R the distance from the sphere. will go very fast, will decrease the temperature as I move far from my injection. Right. If I do in solar wind, and we will, with this technique, we can measure the temperature at different distances from the sun, really doesn't match at all with adiabatic. So here it's a break, strong break with fluid dynamics, uh, with adiabatic fluids. It means that your wind is eating much more when it goes away. This is crucial. And on this, they built space missions. The space missions that are, you see today, they, they are partially want to answer to this question, why the temperature is so high? It means that the, the heat flux in the plasma is zero. It means that your pressure is supposed to be like rho to gamma, okay? It's like an adiabatic disclosure for your, for your internal energy, okay? Really a fluid like compressible flow. But here you see, the energy drops very more smoothly. Why is this? Probably because there are turbulence and wave-like activities that eat more the plasma. For example, ion cyclotron and other effects. But, but uh, when we think, this is another good point, when we think about Landau damping, we see a plasma which is very magnetized, we perturb it with little fluctuations. Oh, it doesn't have to be a magnetized. I'm speaking about just about magnetized plasmas and it's very well, be, well behaved, but is in the perturbative regime. Okay, small fluctuations usually to, to do the, your Landau integrals, right? Um, to do so, 
you imagine some wave like that perturb your plasma, you do your recipe, you, and the, the math can be even challenging sometimes. But observation tells us that first, first this level of fluctuation is very high. Delta F over F is not order epsilon, it's not minimal, it's order two, 200 times, okay, when you go to, to your perturbative limit, first thing. Second thing, the plasma is really unhomogeneous. If you take the difference between two points here, you see it's very easy. I have a time series f of t with my Python code, and I do f of one minus f of two. Then I do f of two minus f of three, and so on. I can measure differences. The differences are difference in time, but really with this hypothesis, are difference in space, are gradients. We are measuring gradients when you do compute the increments. And the gradients are tremendously large. In solar wind. It means that this flow is high level of fluctuation, is very turbulent, and it has spikes, sharp gradients that uh, uh, pollute your database. And they are localized. You see, they are not all over the place. They are really localized in regions. So these are ingredients, but, but so we are extracting ingredients, turbulence, power loss, and uh, gradients, and anomalies in temperature. And speaking about the anomaly in temperature, if you go to MHD, MHD assumes like a collisional Maxwell-Boltzmann equilibrium, okay? Your distribution function is a Maxwellian for MHD. It's a single Maxwellian for the basic MHD, I'm not speaking about multi-fluid with different temperatures. With, for the basic MHD case, you have a single Maxwellian with a single temperature. It means that if you go to your VX, Vy and Vz space, your uh, velocity distribution function, your f is going to be a, a sequence of spheres. My f will be proportional to the density, to one temperature, and to my bulk flow. A single uh, isotropic scalar. Okay, but but if you go to the solar wind and measure you can measure velocity distribution functions now with high cadence and high resolution. We don't observe this. We observe that our distribution function as different is really something like this, is very distorted, has different temperatures. And in particular from the pressure tensor, you can measure the pressure tensor with respect to the mean field. And you will see that T parallel and T perp are much different from one. It means that your MHD should, for different betas, should all stay on this line. This is a scatter plot of the data between beta and temperature and isotropy. Yes? Is the Brazilian pot, they, we call it this. Oh, this is a big question. Okay. This is a a tremendous question in the expansion. There are many, we will have time later to answer to this. We will show some with the simulations, we can recover this. Okay, we, will, can, we can understand this. It's a very important point, but it's too early now. This is just to look extracting from the data. If you look at this, you have, because you are familiar with this topic. So for the audience, it's better to arrive to the point step by step. So here you scatter plot the data, and it's telling you that the high density is here, the center. It means that uh, more or less the solar wind is a beta order one plasma with temperature anisotropy on the order of one. But the anisotropy varies a lot. So there are regions with temperature anisotropy like 10 and in regions with where the ratio between the two temperatures is 10. So imagine you instead of having a sphere, you have an ellipsoid with a temperature which is like 10 times the one on the transverse direction. Or regions where you have like T parallel over T perp bigger than one, okay? You have all of them. So this is a coverage of 10 years of data. It's very statistically relevant. It tells you that your solar wind has anomalies. And here you can see some, uh, I'm, we are showing some uh, plasma instabilities that probably you are familiar with, like the mirror instability or oblique fire rows. There are many instabilities in plasmas. Mm, but this is for protons. Weibel for protons is highly suppressed. For electrons, uh, you must go better go to high relativistic plasma to, to, to see the Weibel to be very active. Of course, it's crucial for faraway objects. But in this one here, 
uh, you can see that the pl plasma nicely stays bounded by these uh, instability regions. So what does it mean? It means that really the plasma, if it enters this region here, if you put the, your plasma here, will immediately reestablish some isotropy and emit waves. So we'll go through the instability process and emit waves. So you never observe it because it's stable with respect to that instability. Doesn't mean that the instability is not happening. It means that it's modulating your plasma. It's very active because the plasma cannot cross this. Otherwise, immediately it will produce insta local instabilities. So turbulence is a very rich fauna of, um, of entertainment with fluctuations and kinetic effects. We cannot um, overlook this uh, important property here that the plasma needs more temperatures and more and kinetic effects to be, discussed, to be described. To understand all of these ingredients, we need simulations. So, well, you can choose one of the steps to understand the results and any of, the, of it, it has limitations. If you really have infinite computational power, you can go to an uh, end body problem, <laughs> write a Liouville model for your plasma in the phase space and good luck with that. Uh, or you can integrate, lose some, inter inter when you integrate the end body problem, you lose information on the, because you coarse grain your system basically. And then you arrive to a Vlasov Maxwell system of equation, which is, will be our best friend in this course. Okay, well, you couple the Vlas Maxwell equation with the evolution of the velocity distribution function in the phase space. Okay, uh, integrating this, you can go to, you can arrive to two fluids equations, for example. Uh, but when you, when you do that, you assume something on the pressure and you're losing some effects. If you really want to do something large with high resolution and uh, uh, understand the, uh, uh, with maybe with an easier model, which is always very good, you can integrate the fluid equation, uh, make assumption the two fluid equation and obtain MHD equations. If you really want a zero level, model, you neglect the magnetic field and you do a Navier stocks of your wind. Okay, um, you cannot neglect anything more than that. If you want something reasonable, that's what Eugene Parker used to say. You at least you have to start from Navier stocks. Okay. Uh, um, we will uh, skip the Louisville part and then body part. And uh, we will uh, integrate our equation and we will work with this system, which is uh, pretty impressive because it couples a uh, distribution function, which depends on the uh, three position in space, three, three direction in the velocity space and time. So it's a seven dimensional problem where fields and well, particles are hidden into here in, in this velocity distribution function. The densities and the velocities are the moments of this distribution function. And they are coupled through the Maxwell equation to the original equation there. So uh, basically, we want to simulate turbulence in a reasonable uh, box with some assumptions on the boundary conditions uh, by solving that equations. And uh, uh, I will say that there are two uh, philosophies. The first is the Eulerian approach. Re just really take that equation and solve it in a seven dimensional space. I mean, six dimensional space plus time, okay? That will be unfeasible probably um, up to 20 years ago, but now it's feasible, okay? With our computational uh, power. Uh, what is the advantage when you solve directly the equation you see? The advantage is that you don't have really, really noise you have numerical errors, but you don't, uh, you're ex exactly solving the system. But of course, it's very computational demanding. If you try to allocate a vector, which is already seven dimensional in your computer, it will freeze. Okay, you don't do that at home. <laughs> okay, just do it on supercomputers. Uh, when, um, in, in, in the way I'm trying to, uh, I, I will explain you. Uh, the second technique is, uh, is very interesting. It's a trick is uh, instead of solving the, BD, the equation of Vlasov, it, it's, uh, it does a Monte Carlo of the Vlasov by uh, integrating, I say, fake particles. As a sort of like these particles are elements of the distribution function. We integrate the particle trajectories and try to reproduce the velocity distribution function with a Monte Carlo technique, okay? 
So in this way, it's very cheap because now you don't solve any more seven dimensional equations, but you solve a question in 3D space, but with billion of particles. If you do some uh, quick hand calculations, you can see that you gain something, but you lose on the precision. You produce noise, particle in cell codes are very noisy and uh, you, we have to deal with this. So since it's a basic course and many of you probably are familiar with fluid or MHD plasma models, um, I, I thought it would be interesting to see the basic steps to build your own code <laughs> in one case or the other. So this will be our, at least the big, for, is, this will be like coding for beginners, okay? <laughs> the first part. And uh, uh, really as a, an example, I will not start from the full blast of Maxwell. Indeed, uh, you can use a trick. Instead of using uh, the blast of equations for both protons and electrons, you can say that electrons are much uh, lighter and uh, you can treat them as a fluid and uh, forget uh, electron inertia. This is called hybrid blast of Maxwell, where you essentially you close your system with a, a Ohm's law, a particular Ohm's law in the electric field. This saves you a lot of, spy of time because then you have to solve only for the protons this. Okay, it's a lot of uh, memory saving, but really we can uh, to show you the basic steps to build a code, we can do a simple 1D, 1V, it means that one velocity and in 1D in space, Vlasov Poisson system, where you neglect even the magnetic field and you use a very reduced system. Because if you know how to simulate this equation, then you can easily implement it to other dimensions and you can go back to the first one, okay? So as a template for our simulation, we will use the uh, blast of Poisson in 1D, 1B. So it's a simple two-dimensional plus time, of course, where the system is written there. So uh, the blast of uh, equation is very important. It's very interesting because it's very, it's essentially a hyperbolic advective equation where you have to just choose the boundary conditions. And uh, really you, if you forget the transport in the velocity space, in space is like really an advection equation, very simple, the basic equation of advection where you have F and the derivative of F, it depends on V, which is a coordinate now and the derivative of F, okay? And you want to integrate this. Uh, first thing, you need three steps. You need to discretize velocity space and uh, the sp sp X space and the velocity space, okay? Discretization, of course, we normalize equations and uh, then you have to create an algorithm. Um, of course, uh, in each point here, since we want to work on a lattice uh, and we need to compute derivatives, in each point you need an approximation to have the to compute the derivatives. Of course, there are many refined way to do this with high order, with like um, uh, superposition of uh, Fourier modes, uh, spectral, uh, and so on. Really, I will go with the basic. So since you will have these slides, the, they will send it to you and the thing is recorded here. I thought I will write all the steps. I will not go through now because it becomes boring otherwise, but you will keep this as your notes, right? And in case one day you want to understand where finite difference comes from because everything starts from finite difference techniques and finite difference starts from a, a Taylor expansion, okay? This is the simple formula to obtain this when you, and you, there are different ways to do that, but, if you try to mimic, to solve the Vlasov equation with a simple finite difference technique, it will blow up immediately. It will create a lot of problems numerically. It will, it's not stable because it's too complex if you, if you want to do and it, there's a lot of nonlinearities. So really what you want to do, for example, is to use this trick, it's called upwind schemes. Uh, upwind means that uh, just really the name is, if I'm computing a derivative in the X direction and the thing, the plasma is moving along the X, I use the points backwards with my Taylor expansion to compute the derivative. This is more stable. It has a, low, a larger small scale diffusion and uh, is more stable for your uh, scheme and is very well used. This is very well known for, for example, for more refined volume, uh, fin finite volume techniques. Okay, using this upwind scheme. So if you use this upwind 
uh, uh, kind of a, a method, uh, your equation becomes stable. You can integrate. Now, what is this? Is was simply one D Vlasov without the term in the velocity space. You see, we we'll now we tested that we know something which is stable in the in that simple verified fake configuration because it does not exist. Of course, you need to to keep all the terms for Vlasov, right? But then, since you learn that this technique is stable, you apply this upwind technique both in the velocity space and in the in the physical space and in the velocity space. Okay, something is moving in this phase space. To compute derivatives, you always look backward, and this stabilizes things. So you can combine. This is like a typical splitting technique that we use in my university, my group where like you really advance the velocity distribution function first in space, and then you do one step in velocity space. And when you do this, you use uh, the points backwards behind the wave, which is pro propagating the characteristic uh, with a characteristic velocity. So you really move along the characteristics. And if you want the solution from one point in this uh, phase space to another, really you are doing like with two steps, moving first in physical space, space and then in the velocity space and uh, with very small discretization uh, mesh, meshes then you can arrive really uh, with a fairly good uh, 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 precision to the final solution of course you need to test this with uh, waves with templates with test beds we call it so you need to have some uh, tests and uh, verify it numerically and uh, this is very, very powerful and very robust numerically. That's what we will use for the Eulerian case. But, but, see, the Eulerian case is not so difficult because it's very expensive. Then you need to create vectors in multi dimensions and it's going to be very expensive numerically. Really, the trick is to use the uh, particle and cell techniques. I use both. I do work like 50% of my life with one and the other. I see the advantages. I think sometimes I prefer one or the other. Uh, but uh, this is very interesting, especially if you want to study plasmas where you produce uh, high energy particles. If you want to use simulate a plasma, which is pretty thermal, then I would use, uh, I would recommend to work with Eulerian Vlasov because you have high resolution in the velocity space and the plasma is, is well localized here. But if you're working with like cosmic rays or like very energy particles and you produce very high energy electrons, relativistic electrons, as we will do at the end of the course, then uh, I will recommend more this because the particles can really go too far away. And here you cannot really use a finite volume to describe your plasma. That's the main, uh, main philosophy, I would say. So how to do that? Well, instead of solving that equation, we solve uh, these uh, particle trajectories in the phase space. And so we, do, we go into a Lagrangian world. We solve into a Lagrangian sorry, sorry, here is a total derivative, of course, it's not a partial. And uh, we solve this equation in the phase space. And uh, there are a number of techniques. As before, there are stable and less stable techniques. Usually the adams bashford or the Boris technique is very good for integrating particles. So what's the trick here? This is an example, okay? Uh, we need to integrate particles to reproduce this F. Hmm? But we also need to solve Maxwell equations. So the Maxwell equations will be solved on a lattice, on a grid in physical space, in X, Y, and Z, okay? Because Maxwell is what it is, right? It's a series of partial differential equations for numerics on a lattice with a time evolution. So our electric and magnetic field will be on a fixed grid in physical space, huh? while uh, the particles will be th free to fly in the continuum, even not on the grid points, in the continuum. They will fly around in this phase space, moving both in X and in V. Hmm? So this has to, be done can be done in a serious way and this is very was a, a very smart one first you like um, start from initial condition uh, upgrade the fields by using moments of the vdf then once you upgrade the fields the fields will interfere with particles then you upgrade the particles 
then the particles move a little bit, you recompute the moments, the moments will make the fields upgrade, and then tuck, 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 both of them, okay? Except the one works in, the, in a meshless space because the particle can fly uh, for free in, a free in the continuum, and the other one are defined on a grid. Of course, you immediately see the problem when doing this is that particles are not located in your mesh. Here, the meshes are in blue. You can really go everywhere. But the, you know the fields only in the blue regions. So to advance particles, you need the fields here. Therefore, you have to interpolate. The interpolation is a big problem because for each interpolation, you introduce an error. And this error is populating your system. And it's like um, it's making your system very noisy. That's where it comes from. Okay. So how can you? Uh, uh, also the error of the interpolation, but also the fact that you have a finite number of particles to re reproduce your velocity distribution function. You really, to be a pure Vlasov, you need to have like an infinite number of particles. Of course, this is unfeasible. And anytime you have a finite number of particles, you will have more noise because you want to reproduce F by integrating in the velocity space in, 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 by doing a local coarse graining, okay? You have particles. Like I have a bunch of particles here in a little cube. And each particle is, a, uh, is in a single position because my cube is, is elementary, it's very small. And uh, each particle has a velocity. One is pointing there, one is there. I have like 10,000 particles in an infinitesimal volume. I want to reproduce F, I do an histogram locally. I'm here, I reproduce my velocity distribution function by bidding particles into little subcubes. And I can reproduce F in a, in a single point where there are a lot of particles, okay? This is, again, creates a lot of noise. It's very noisy and it's damaging our numerical. There is no walls in my, in, my, in, my, uh, in my talk because we are studying the plasma which is flying away from the sun. And um, you will see in a moment, why? I mean, I'm not caring about boundary conditions. We will see in a moment by the hypothesis of homogeneity of turbulence. We, we, we will see. But uh, so far, now we forget. Of course, if you want to study tokamak plasmas, you have to be very, um, uh, very aware of what is happening, for example, in the scrape of layer of a, of a tokamak devices or close to the diverter. There actually, there is also pollution from neutrals, which is coming in. Actually, with some students, we study this with uh, fluid-like models. But uh, uh, really, we will not care about more laboratory plasma problems, OK, so far, OK, in a, in a little. So here, oh, I, here in, each, in, each, in each slide, I'm not mentioning you during my talk because I'm trying to show you the, just the steps. But again, with the slides, you have the literature on this with, from important seminal papers, OK, in, green, in, the, in the green uh, with in this kind of, uh, in the, here you can see that I, I also report the, the basic literature on this, on each step. So you interpolate, and uh, just in case you want to interpolate something, uh, it's important, even if you work on a completely different subjects, like doing like tracing of passive tracers or things like this, it's good that you know the, basic, uh, uh, the basics of the algorithm that are on this simple slide. This is a typical trilinear interpolation, which is very, pretty precise. I will say, in case you want to interpolate uh, the motion of a single tracer in the in the continuum, when whenever you know the uh, the, vi the values on a lattice, okay, I'm sure most of you will deal with this. So, of course, you if you want to do this uh, calculation, once we built two codes so far, <laughs> one Eulerian and one with the, this uh, Monte Carlo particle Lagrangian way. Uh, if you write your code, to, to, I know most of you will go back now and write your code. And <laughs> if you try to run it on your laptop, it, it will just not move. <laughs> okay, before it does, a, it does a reasonable time step on your uh, little uh, laptop or your cell phone or your, or your computer. Really, this is not efficient. It's, it's not really going too far. You have to wait really a lot. So what uh, you, we really need to do is to, since we have a lot of information here, we have a VDF which is seven dimensional, and we all we have a lot of particles. So really, to have a, a reasonable amount of noise is too much for a single computer. Then we go to multi grid to multi 
process, processors. Usually, we the, the basic the basics are here for the good parallel parallelization. You can use two philosophies to to make your code uh, uh, parallel. Even go using like open MP directives, like is sort of like adding some uh, flags to your uh, cycles that accelerate the processing. This is more like um, um, hardware like, but uh, I prefer this one. This is the most efficient one is by using mass message passing uh, uh, informations. Um, how it works? Well, instead of solving a single my problem, which has a number of points in X, Y, Z, for example, on a single computer, I divide the domain through processors. Okay, I divide my domain and uh, uh, into a number of processors. This is the basic one. For example, process zero is the in the first centimeters of my volume. Process one in the in the close in the neighbors one, and, and so on. I give to each one of these processors the same number of points for example, and each one solves the equations locally, of course. But when you do use this uh, kind of directives, processor two doesn't know anything about processor one, nothing to be very efficient. They have to work really locally, okay? If you work with uh, local operators like finite differences. So each one of them works locally, but they don't know anything. Of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, for finite difference, if we want to, uh, approximate delta f dx, this is going to be f of x plus delta x minus f of x minus delta x divided 2 delta x. And of course, sometimes I will arrive in the, in, I will encounter this problem when one f is defined in one professor and the other one is in the neighbor, but the other one doesn't know the other, right? Okay, for processor zero, I will hit a boundary when I need extra an extra slice. To do so, of course, we have to send their messages, okay, like lovers. <laughs> okay, one sends the message, one sends the information, this row of data to the next processor, the other processor receives it and send back the message, like a WhatsApp. Tuck, tuck, okay, they send this message, they communicate this, they store the extra slice, and then they can do the calculation and move on. This is very efficient, this is very fast. It's really, you have to wait until the two processors communicate. So this is one of the first things I do with my, my PhD students, is just to train to do this and to learn how to think in different processors. It's very difficult. You have to spend some time at the beginning. It's just a philosophy. A processor doesn't know anything about the other. As can just collect and spread information, but you don't have to collect and spread too much. Otherwise, your computation slows down. We want to keep it very, very, very light. So if you do so, and suppose I have a, a, a a problem that takes one year on my laptop, I can arrive to solve a problem in like uh, 15, 20 minutes on a supercomputer, depending on the number of processors. Okay, it's very powerful. Otherwise, you cannot use the kinetic simulations to understand plasmas. Uh, with MHD, I would say you can still do reasonable simulations even in a single uh, CPU. So what's the result of my scheme? Uh, well, uh, this is one of the simulations where at the beginning, there is a counter-streaming plasma flow. It's a full plasma, this. It's a plasma made by ions and electrons with like my, is, is my full seven dimensional plasma. Uh, this was very expensive on a supercomputer in the States. Um, and uh, basically, let me go back because, okay. You cannot see it here, but essentially there is a shearing flow like the one with the, that produces a Kelvin Elmos, okay? Uh, and this is the current of the of the electrons. It's like the more or less from the Maxwell is like the the the, the curl of the magnetic field. This is telling us the gradients of the magnetic field. As you can see, if you wait a little bit, it start, um, a lot of instability triggers locally, uh, both the secondary Kelvin Helmholtz and also tearing tearing like and also uh, also Rayleigh Taylor. They observed in this locally. You have a lot of instabilities while the cascade proceeds. And uh, at the end, to answer your question, you will see that uh, there is a pattern here, which is, uh, uh, which is pretty much like a Van Gogh, pa Van Gogh paint <laughs> with no boundary condition. The, band the system locally forgets about your shear. So this is what we call it like, uh, if you take a small box here, we call it like uh, uh, homogeneous turbulence. 
There is no preferred direction. There are vortices everywhere. And this is very convenient because once you have homogeneous turbulence, there is a trick to solve the questions and you use periodic boundary conditions. Imagine you have a system that has no preferred direction, no mean gradient, it pretty, becomes pretty much homogeneous. Therefore, I can use my periodic boundary condition and I don't have to care anymore about this. So even in a case where boundaries count, like in a, in a Kelvin Helmholtz, at the, in, if I wait enough, I go to a turbulent regime, I'm pretty much, uh, and I want to do a local analysis, if I want to understand like what happens on the box scale, no, you have to impose some boundaries. And there, is, there are solutions also for, for full particles. But if I'm interested in the, in the nature of turbulence locally, then no, I can, uh, okay, I'm almost done actually. So uh, I will skip this, which is about global MHD simulations, but you can, now we can start to do global simulations of uh, turbulence by using full particles in cell. This uses a, 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 a hybrid Vlasov, electrons are like fluids, and this is like the magnetosphere with full peak. So there is a wind flowing in this direction. And from MHD, from simulation of MHD was pretty much uh, uh, everything well known, everything well behaved. There is some turbulence, but it's symmetric. If you send some solar wind through an obstacle with MHD, you don't see too much surprises. But if you do it with a, a code which has full particle, full kinetic physics, you see, you see some anomalies. And the anomalies are on the fact that there is a mean field and particles behave differently when there is a mean field. And here you start to see an influence, uh, more turbulence here, because there is a mean field which is perpendicular to the shock and particles like are accelerated. There is a forest shock and producing local instabilities. And there is all that beautiful <laughs> blast of uh, models uh, and uh, um, probably Landau damping, also an ion cyclotron a lot in this forest shock. So things change if you they like do large simulations, yes. Uh, again, here we see this same. So again, to go back to the, my, the point before, really this is a zoom in of this large scale peak simulation. It becomes pretty homogeneous again, even in interaction with a shock. Before it was a, a Kelvin Helmholtz, yes. homogeneous that uh, the level of fluctuation are statistically the same all over the volume there are the homogeneous turbulence will be like this here a lot of fluctuation and here quiet this is an homogeneous turbulence homogeneous is when i have fluctuation on the same level everywhere in the same the, yes pretty much Yeah, uh, uh, for example, think about a system where I have like a boundary layer. In the boundary layer, there is a lot of energy close to the boundary, far away. The, the, the level is so this, that's an example of unhomogeneous turbulence, okay? Which has you have to take into account the boundary conditions. So since I have a few minutes, then we can extract to understand the turbulent cascade from global simulation. We can do a zoom in and uh, 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 essentially. I think I can continue this later. You can do simulations locally uh, of blasts of turbulence with high resolution. And uh, I, will, I, I will stop it here for the, for the break. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It means that you have a vortices of all directions. Well, all, in all directions means a isotropic, but uh, you have vortices of all sizes. And the number of vortices of a given size is the same here as here. So we have one question there. Yeah. Um, when you say on the system, there is a preference uh, direction for the liquid? Yes, there is a. In, in that, in the, for example, in the shock turbulence interaction, yes, there's a mean field, which is the field from the sun. It's the field coming from an exterior, like a, a device. Okay, uh, that mean field creates a lot of differences. You have turbulence that becomes anisotropic. 
And isotropic means that starts to, the, your vortices, instead of being nice spheres, will uh, elongate along the mean field. Doesn't contradict what, we're, what he was saying, that you can have vortices of different sizes everywhere, but just they flip, they align with the mean flow. Exactly, exactly. There, there's a preferred direction. That's the plasma. Maybe there is another question. Yes? Okay, another question. Uh, I would like to get some kind of... Uh... For the power law. Oh, okay, okay. The power law, the Kolmogorov law says that your energy spectrum, your energy at a K, which is proportional to the, you can decompose a field with a Fourier transform. And you take the amplitudes of these Fourier modes, the energy is the amplitude square, more or less. Okay. The energy as a function of this k vector from the Kolmogorov law goes like to k to minus five thirds. Okay. Uh, but in when uh, with the things I was showing before, we were plotting, uh, plotting as a function of frequency, we, like, like E of F as a. Okay, it's related to the Taylor hypothesis. Okay, uh, X is equal minus V zero T, where V is the bulk flow. So you see, this is related to frequency. This is related to the K vectors. Immediately, you can uh, obtain one direction, one, one to one, it's linear, right? It just goes through V zero. So either you can use K or you can use frequency. Frequency is related to T. It just, there is a velocity. Which is the velocity of the flow? Okay, it's, you can, uh, but it's because of the initial one. That's why I spent like a few minutes on this because is uh, is the mother assumption of uh, all the measurements that the, my my flow is frozen. Linear MHD, no. For linear MHD, there is no cascade for linear. Mm, I think we may need some more time to chat about this. No, you can have spectrum. Yeah, it's very large amplitude, but from linear theory, you can have some sort of cascade of like, like wave, wave like interactions that produce some very steep low that do not match the result though, huh? okay. It's not even that. It's more independent. independent. Do not interact. The quasi-linear one. There are some weird cap, weak coupling that can produce it. Uh, tomorrow afternoon there, there will be a more much more informal session with the Sergio Alina. So it would be a good chance to to, to derive that. <laughs> And address the, all these many questions that were still unanswered. So, so if you want to, yeah, I I just want to make this uh, one thing. First of all, I'm totally uh, thankful to you, Sergio. You agreed to do what I was trying to do, so that will take some load off my head. I was able to. I was going to give a short lecture and try to derive the Kolmogorov spectrum. Okay. So I'm glad you do it. Oh, no. <laughs> that is wonderful. And then show its connectivity. Okay. Now I'm going to give you guys a very simple problem to play with. And do play with it even if uh, you know. So let's write uh, uh, let me just take it up a bit. Let's write the Vlasov equation of a one-dimensional Vlasov equation without any force, mm -hmm. okay? No forces, it's just a convection. Mm -hmm. And then my initial condition is at t equal to zero, some f is some function of velocity, mm -hmm. okay? So from this little problem, I want you to show that when you try to construct the density FDV, all right, demonstrate to me Landau damping. 
there is no force, nothing of the sort. All right. It is, and in fact, you will find out the origin of planetary gravity is basically a very large number of moons, the different phases, all right, mixing together, all right, so that there will be different and this will also tell you what are the conditions required on G. What are the conditions in the last sentence, what You will you will have to tell me when will G V. When or, will G V? What class of G V will give you random gamma? Okay, what class will not? Okay. 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 Obviously, if we if G V is going to represent the distribution of particles, right? I mean, let let's make it. Uh, going to zero at infinity, right? I mean, it will make sense. So, so you will figure out this is a very trivial and a very profound problem. And I all I want you guys to struggle, even if you don't get there, but the struggle itself will be worth a value. Okay, all right, go ahead and have some tea. Okay, on uh, JP, uh, Journal of Plasma Physics yeah. was? Okay, I think I saw it. I, I didn't read it yet. I downloaded it. I will do. Many new results. Okay. okay. And I'd like to. You know, maybe you can see them. Yes, yes, yes. I will check. But, I mean, Is it this year, right? It's, it's, a, it's an analytic paper. Isn't this, this year, 2022? I think 2021. Okay. Okay, we'll go. So do have a look before you go. Yes, absolutely. Good. Thanks. I hope that the, the level is this is the level you were asking. For. Okay. I was I was going to do the Kolmogorov. Uh, okay, everybody. I will. I resume the recording. It was on pause. I did it. I did. Okay. Okay. Fine. Is it Yes. And uh, I skills are not helping you. No, it's a. Pause it. I also have. Oh, now it works. Yes. Oh wow. Oh. Oh. Not this not the laser, is it? This for uh, For what? For this slide? Oh. Slide, slide. Oh, really? That works. Yeah. I just wrote And it worked in both. No. I don't think it works. Yeah, but well, this is just for the laser, right? Yes. Fine. No, no. No. Oh, cool. Yes. Thanks. So yeah. let's get started for the second talk by yeah. Professor Tedrillo. Yeah, I was two slides later, actually, <laughs> to reach the main part of the, the first part of the course. Now we will uh, simulate uh, little boxes where the site is uh, smaller than typical gradient sites. So we will assume a constant B, homogeneity, and we will forget about the large scales. So there is a recipe to do this. Of course, we can start, when you have a mean field, it introduces an isotropy. It means that the turbulence develops more perpendicular to the field. So it's a good uh, uh, approach will be to use a 2D simulation with the mean field going up. So we are looking at the plasma like this, the mean field is pointing to us, and look at the vortices that develop with a full blast of a, a model. That's what we will do. We will use boundary conditions and some, uh, here there is some recipe for the, our Eulerian simulations. Uh, one thing we have to fix is the level of fluctuation with respect to the average field. That's important because on solar wind is order one half, order one just to, again, to stress that this is a system which is far, very far from being linear. It's a very large amount of, it's not order epsilon, this delta B over B. In the, on the corona, we, where I have to say that one of my first papers was the, by, the one by Daniel when he wrote the simulation of a reduced MHD with Pablo on the corona. corona. Then if you have a strongly magnetized then system, then delta B over B is order epsilon, very small with a strong mean field. And that you can see really a lot of turbulence there, but this is different now. We are in the solar wind. We will set up this simulation. How to set, what is the initial condition? That's a good point, actually, if you want to study a simulation, uh, study a, a homogeneous turbulence is to uh, fulfill, you want large scale vortices, like really my stirring coffee. I want to build 
uh, coffee of plasma and I inject energy only at large scales. So in the Fourier space, this becomes like injecting energy only at lower case. Okay, I put as initial condition this with random faces. I back transform, I have a random nice field. If I wait enough, and then I start my Vlasov simulation on a thousand and thousand of processors. And at the end, that's what I produce. I, I see a, a sea of islands. They reconnect. That's what turbulence is. With and there are strong um, current sheets in between them. So this is a typical plot of turbulence. Uh, if you do the Fourier spectra of this field, you will see nice analogies with solar wind. This is the typical Vlasov simulation. With the average, we are simulating this part here. You see, uh, the spectral index is comparable with observation. Plus, we see that the electric power power spectrum, the power spectrum of the electric field, as in the observation, have a, as an enhancement with respect to the mean field. This can be related to the all effect, where because the all effect it has a J cross B term is well uh, established in the literature. In the literature, that the all effect produces more high frequency. Uh, electric field, okay? Probably with, you have dispersive waves. Sorry? Oh, okay, yes, yes, that's what I was saying. Uh, in the solar wind, they have the, still are the doubt if it's like kinetic alpha wave regimes or Whistler regime. Um, I, I don't want to enter this debate because they are both possible. They can co coexist, why not? Lower average plasma. No, no, this is kinetic, is the branch from. No, no, no. This is. is... Not at all. Actually, it's the opposite. No. Order, order one. Plasma is here, is less than one. So it's uh, they have all the branches are active and it's turbulent. So careful with kinetic alpha waves because still there is a big group today trying to find waves in plasmas. But if you do a dispersion relation of this simulation, as we demonstrated in 2010, there is no waves. You don't see any dispersion relation in, if you drive turbulence to be. The, you see all the waves. Okay, let's say that there are all the waves. <laughs> And no, and no waves, okay? Because you have a, the, most of the energy is in structures. What we really see in these simulations is strong current sheets. Now, the only thing about kinetic alpha is that it's quite highly localized to the X. And the, and the reason for that is that the, the confinement of the kinetic alpha comes essentially from. Uh, uh, the properties the system has at its core. If, for instance, electron mass was taken to be zero, right, mm -hmm. then it would become an effort function. Yeah. So, most of the time, what happens, kinetic alpha is created by either electron inertia or some finite high radius. Right. Sorry. No problem. So, in this second part, I will really look at the result of our kinetic simulations. What is what, what do we see? We see that there is a contact between simulation. We can reproduce the spectra of observations. But with simulation, you have much more. You have the full phase space. You can really look at everything now. With, with observation, you are just related to this 1D cut with observational constraints and noise and errors. But now, at least we, we can discuss a little bit more with simulation. We can speculate, let me say. Okay. So in the second part, we will uh, look do a local analysis, and uh, then since we saw something strange in the simulations, we go back to the new missions. So you see our pathway. We started from from observation very old turbulence. We repeated with our simulations. With simulation, we see something strange, unexpected. We go back to the new missions. New missions, I mean MMS. For example, the, one of the latest missions uh, uh, in a, uh, with very high resolution measurements, and we see if, the, if there is again a link with reality between for our simulations. So we always hear about magnetic reconnection. So magnetic reconnection, magnetic reconnection uh, must be there somewhere. Somewhere must be there. 
uh, what is magnetic reconnection? Well, it's a change of topology where there is a very efficient conversion of energy, which is embedded in our um, in, in the magnetic field, and then it's transferred to particles, either with flows or with acceleration or eating. You see, flows, acceleration, and eating, three things. The connection is a conversion from magnetic energy. There is a reservoir of energy in the magnetic field that exchanges with particles. It can accelerate and move to kinetic and non-thermal features, as we will see. So, but this is a very basic cartoon. And since we were a child, and here is my daughter, actually, uh, we, you, we always know that when you do magnetic reconnection, you have to have a nice box with nice boundary condition, no noise at the beginning, very little, 10 to, 10 to minus 9% of noise. You perturb the current sheet. You follow the recipe. It's very orthodox, very well behaved. If you want to study reconnection and see all the tearing, instability, you have to do it in a proper way with well-known boundary condition. And there is a really a large amount of works on this. I will not enter, not even enter the discussion on this. We will do it uh, an unorthodox procedure. We will produce turbulence. And then uh, in uh, here, we will look for local magnetic reconnection. We will not care about initial condition and boundary condition at all. We will produce a very high, this is a very high simulation, very high resolution simulation by Pablo Dimitruk like 32,000 square MHD with the, a lot of current sheets. So at the beginning, I was a young student looking for reconnection in turbulence, and I was very discouraged by this. I mean, oh my God, here there is no, be no reconnection. It's very difficult to find reconnection here. But, but if you zoom in this box and you go in a local frame, you start to see something like, looks like reconnection with the field lines that touches the strong current sheet. And therefore, if you want to study reconnection from the other perspective, when you are in a fully nonlinear regime, you have to jump into the local frames here and imagine that you are in a landscape of mountains. And the mountains have peaks that are the eyes of the vortices and saddle points that are the passes between. The saddle points are the passes between two peaks and two valleys. Okay, so imagine here you are in a landscape with Google map and you want to uh, measure this. You can study the Hessian matrix of the magnetic potential. You study the Hessian matrix and you find maxima and minima. And by definition, reconnection is a, a course only at the X points where there, you have saddle points where there are current layers, very strong. So you jump here and you can measure re reconnection rate as the electric field at the X points. So you do that systematically. It's a network. It's a neural network with islands that merge interact, repulse. It's a complex family of islands that are interacting. In each one, there are spots where a connection is occurring. And in each spot, you statistically can measure the reconnection rate. So there is no, not a unique reconnection rate in turbulence, but there is a broad distribution with very, very large numbers, values. So there are regions that are very quiet. Yes. A magnetic island is a closed torus in 2D, something like this. And the, this is the direction. The isosurfaces of the magnetic potential are the field lines, hmm? by definition. The I is the null point of the magnetic field. So positive, if your vortex, if your flux rope is spinning this way, negative, simply the other way. Exactly, in that sense, okay? Since it's homogeneous turbulence, you can have... A, you see it in turbulence vortices that spin in one side and the other side. Same is for the magnetic field. Remember, these are like 2D cuts. So these are, there is a current here. And therefore, sometimes this current sheet, this, uh, this uh, flux rope will encounter another one which is spinning like this. Huh? When they are, and there are two filaments with the po same polarity. You know what, what, the, what is happening, right? From physics courses, they attract. That's really the first um, uh, cartoon that uh, Giovannelli, an Italian war living in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Australia, thought about. Mm, reconnection probably is something when you have two field lines, two flux ropes that encounter, attract because of the force. And then in, the, in between them, you have a, lie, a layer. This is the basic mechanism, the basic cartoon you have when you have in mind 2D reconnection, I will say. Two or one, and then you zoom in there, and again you have the nice, all the nice tearing like properties. But here we don't care about all the process to reach 
to every connection. We are looking just at one snapshot, measure the current shift, the, the reconnection rate. And then we, here we model it with a modified structure, uh, modified suite Parker in MHD. And nicely, there is a good agreement with, uh, with a, a nonlinear stage of reconnection because it's fully nonlinear, the process. We don't really follow the, 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 each single one of them. It, we do a statistical analysis. And it's, uh, the question is that, is this now uh, uh, related anyhow to observations? Right? Our obsession is observation. Okay? So before doing this, we went to a technique that now is called, and I didn't know this, virtual spacecraft technique. Um, in 2007, we did invent, think that if you, you can send a spacecraft, you have a turbulent reg regime, and uh, turbulence in the solar wind is like flowing through your probe. Now you can do a Galilean transform and in mimic, you can mimic the solar wind by flying through turbulence. So we will mimic solar wind measurements by flying, sending us a virtual spacecraft through our turbulent uh, field. Okay, this uh, yellow path here is my spacecraft, which is flying through my box. Okay, in this way, you can really mimic, mimic the, 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 acquisition of data, okay? And if you do the statistics, you can measure increment, increments. The statistic from the simulation are these lines here. Uh, here there's a comparison with observations. Really, the, 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 the increments are not Maxwellian. I mean, the increments are not Gaussian. You see, the Gaussian is typical of random numbers. If you take difference of two random numbers and you do a distribution, you will find this. But if you do it with simulations or observation, you will find very large tails. It means that these tails are unexpected. Something like extraordinary, something like explosive, okay? Something like intermittent. So the question now is like, uh, uh, we kind of invented this simple technique to measure this intermittency, these intermittent structures. You have a time series, okay, that B, you can just take the increments, but you can normalize to the RMS value to the average of the mean square displacement. So if it's a Gaussian, this value still should say around uh, for this plot around eight mm? with random numbers because it's random numbers are bounded. But everything that is extraordinary will go behind this and it makes you identify a, a, a singular structure. Okay, it's very statistic. I have a sample box. I know the distribution of the random numbers for this. And thanks to this distribution, I can select the extreme events. It's a self-adjusting threshold to, to identify the, the events. Now we send this, our spacecraft, our virtual spacecraft with this green line here through our, my probe. And uh, the blue regions are the reconnection uh, re uh, regimes, uh, reconnection uh, uh, singular structures locally that we, identify by a means of uh, studying the action of the matrix, as we were saying before, while the open circles here are the peaks of, the, of this uh, PVI measurement. This uh, technique is called PVI when you set the threshold. And as you can see, there is an excellent match for the strongest color sheet. You don't catch all of them, of course. You have to catch it really nicely going through your current layer. But for the strongest one, maybe 90% works. So why do we do this? Because then once we built this, we can go back to reality. This is a simulation, this is the solar wind. We can do distributions and they, for very small scales, they really look nicely. As you can see, there is a departure at very large scales between data, the red and the measured one. Why? Because at very large scales, you are starting to feel the inhomogeneity of turbulence. Our box was a local box. We are simulating local, conditions. We cannot simulate like really all the solar wind. So that's why there is the mismatch, but the statistics are small scales. is similar, it's very encouraging. So then we went back with Jack Gosling, which was a, a very famous uh, researcher in the field of uh, magnetic reconnection in solar wind. And uh, he was very skeptical of this. Yeah, no, no, you cannot identify reconnection. You do that, you need my idea of reconnection. You need to uh, use a, a look at flows, a peaks in the densities. He, has a, he had a lot of recipes for Sweet Parker-like reconnections and he said, no, your model is not gonna work. Indeed, but, 
<laughs> then he did like so much that we co-authored some papers because for the strongest events we were able to identify you see this is our uh, there was a pvi series here was able to identify this uh, you see there is the peak that was um, identified the same current sheet that came from like more physical like re reasoning so our method was statistically statistical but for very high threshold it selects the physical reconnecting sites so uh, discontinuities the strongest discontinuities very likely in the solar wind can be sites of reconnection where if you do some uh, statistical averaging of the temperature it can be demonstrated that uh, these current sheets are hotter something strange is happening here you have current sheet uh, that produces locally sh short gradients but locally these gradients are hotter than the surrounding plasma so you are producing eating of the solar wind uh, and you can observe it here with from 10 years of data some I, don't, I will not spend time on the statistical uh, details but all of this was mhd and mhd is cheating <laughs> because it's using uh, resistivity and uh, viscosity and our plasma uh, the resistivity the collision the collisional parameter is zero i would say in solar wind is negligible collisions we have so what we thought in the years is like why don't we repeat the same experiment instead of m with mhd with our good blast of code so you repeat it again what you found is that of course the picture in space is very similar this is very encouraging for people that work with mhd because you still will have islands reconnection and all of these nice things nothing weird happenings there but what you see is that you can measure the temperature anisotropy something that you don't have it in mhd essentially locally you can go jump into a point here and you have your velocity distribution function f x and t and from this you can measure my temperature tensor or my pressure tensor and this is everything but maxwellian it means that the plasma near to the x points is becoming non-maxwellian the novelty with respect to mhd is that my plasma locally is becoming strongly non-maxwellian now now we see the pieces of the puzzle that come in together in a little uh, this is an example there are regions where my my distribution function is not a nice sphere as a mhd guy will say it's more like of a potato it's a potato elongated with some directions with three axes as we are very weird potato okay. yes this is still a 2d simulation in a little bit we will see the 3d simulation yeah, what's, what's t parallel then or it can be t parallel can be larger than one than t per or vice versa this is just the, the answer to your question there are regions where where you have t parallel smaller than t per you see and he regions where my distribution function is aligning with b you have both okay why not so there are regions probably where there is a mirror instability locally the regions probably when you are like ion cyclotron or other things why not so then we go to the 3d of course we want to do the 3d uh, it took some time to go to the 3d because now this is a seven dimensional simulation of turbulence and uh, you zoom in here you see these are like vortices in blast of turbulence and you have current sheets that are are like these uh, pancakes red pancakes and the anisotropy are like nebulas close to this uh, this uh, uh, current sheet so this is what is happening in 3d you start to observe the production of a beam because of ion cyclotron resonances you have compressive wave excite ion cyclotron you see now it's plasma physics again we can do now plasma physics locally maybe qualitatively and we don't really follow instabilities but you can see that there is a production of a beam which is observed in the solar wind constantly so then along the mean field you have the particle resonate with the, your field and produces this field aligned beams okay now there was a somewhere before a guy that was asking me hmm, how do you build that uh, brazil plot there okay okay in each point you have uh, f in your simulation in each point you have uh, your pressure tensor by using the uh, bi i will say tij bj this is sort of like uh, i don't remember it now uh, some sort of like projecting this you can build the parallel and per temperature you can measure it right in each point you have two scalars t parallel and t per so each one of these points is a point in this diagram 
you can do it in the solar wind or you can do it with your simulations. Now to cover all the solar wind, you can only do it with a single small simulation. What you do is to take little volumes all over the heliosphere with deep varying the plasma parameters and you can cover the full phase space. That's a trick, okay? Instead of do a global simulation, you do a lot of local simulations. This is probably a very trivial question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your initial distribution function? Maxwellia. Is your experiment with a Maxwellia? Yes, but we have forces. With, with respect to your nice experiment, which I, I encourage you to do it because it's very extractive, we have forces. Yes. Uh, electrons at this level are still are fluids. We, we repeated this, but. On, on this simulation, yes, that's hybrid, but we, can they, can they, can they, can they, yes, can, so they can. Can they also have fast speed? Yes, uh, not for the simulations, but we repeated this with also with electrons and they have another, they have other physics in, okay, it's different. This is only for ions temperature, okay. So now this is the 10 years of collection. This is our simulation, which, okay. Yeah, it's not really looks like identical, but the main feature are uh, uh, you can see some main some analogies with the you see this some segmentation here, which is due to the fact that we have local finite simulation. If you, we if we had infinite power, we will we will we will like we may cover all this phase space more continuously. But there is strong analogies, and this uh, the here. We are measuring this PVI signal, which is telling us that close to these boundaries, the plasma is unstable with respect to kinetic instability. It's very, very, very exciting because it means that the plasma near current layers is unstable with the physics that we know. It is an, an homogeneous, is unstable in an inhomogeneous medium because the this region here it has a strong magnetic shear, so it's not the typical homogeneous instability that we studied on. Test books, right? Is a instability that is acting on an inhomogeneity. Okay. So, but this, this is not the end of the story. And this was nice because at that time we were doing this, but uh, they were also building a new space mission, which is called like multi scale uh, MMS. And uh, at that moment, they were going to very high resolution in the velocity space. And we saw, hmm, since we have the full velocity distribution function, we can invent a new parameter. Okay, when you have VDF, for, ever, for describing a Maxwellian, you just need density, temperature, and bulk flow. Then you can have higher moments like temperature and isotropy, but it's not the end of the story. You can have heat flux, which is like, you can have kurtosis. So you can have a lot of differences. So we kind of invented this parameter, which is, we call it epsilon, you don't have it any better name, uh, which is the difference point-wise between the, your VDF and the associated Maxwellian. You take the difference between your VDF, which is a potato, and the little sphere there, the associated sphere. Why do you do this? Because in this way, you measure the correction to a, of a fluid, to a fluid approach. Everything that is not in the Maxwellian is some extra non-fluid quantity, okay? It's some lo local, local entropy, if you want is related to the correction to the velocity distribution function. So these perturbations are completely non-fluid, non-MHD. So you, with a single parameter, you can look at this parameter. And as you can see, epsilon is high close to the current sheet because ep epsilon includes like anisotropy, heat flux, kurtosis, all the moments of the velocity distribution function. So locally, the current sheet is not producing just anisotropy, it's producing everything. Is making your plasma very far from equilibrium, local in a single spot. So that's how you compute heating also. Yes, absolutely. No, you will see. This is really a good question. You are not driving the system from. You are not putting energy from the outside. No, no, not at all. And this is the answer that you anticipated. Just the, 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 the this this slide. Because um, if you want to speak about eating, I'm very conservative on this. Uh, I never speak about eating or dissipation with Vlaso. Vlasov and dissipation are two words that really disturb me because Vlasov is an ideal model. Um, it really, if you want to do it, you have to have collisions. Dissipative MHD, fine. Dissipative Boltzmann, fine. Dissipative Vlasov, not fine because it's ideal. Uh, so we did uh, very recently, you did the Boltzmann simulations where we solved the same equation and we added a collision operator. 
what we see is that now really is unfortunate that close to the carnage sheet here, there are uh, spikes of this dissipation thing. Now this is very blurred, but from here you can see that in the carnage sheet, you have high dissipation. This is the demonstration that really dissipation is occurring in a carnage sheet from a kinetic uh, uh, world. But you don't need to compute this complicated integral here that I, I didn't even expand it because it's too complex. You just need to compute our epsilon here. This epsilon is the modification to a Maxwellian. It is high, close to the high, is very high at the Carnage sheet. So, is this true in spacecraft missions? Probably it is. This is uh, our MMS spacecraft, which is flying through the bow shock. And the bow shock is a lot of, there is a lot of kinetic effects. So, here is Maxwellian, your plasma. When you cross the bow shock, it becomes really non Maxwellian. And my epsilon, it has a large spike here. This is my epsilon parameter. So this epsilon is localized in space. And uh, why? Because now we go back, uh, we go back and forward between uh, uh, measurements and our simulations. We have both now. We are now in a, in a regime where we can compare di directly with data. Uh, we are flying our satellite through turbulence. This is from simulations. And uh, this is what is happening. There are regions where you start to produce a beam. Here I was playing a little bit. And then it looks like a mushroom. Then you have a beam, then you have multiple beams. While you fly through turbulence, you have different distribution functions. So uh, at some point, you can see if this is true, looking at the spacecraft data. So we took this uh, magnetospheric multiscale mission, which has very high resolution velocity distribution functions. And we fly, we have a recording, we are recording 1D data from magnetic field. You see it's very turbulent. There is compression and there is a lot of turbulence here. But also in each point of that, we have a cube of velocity distribution function, which is like 64 cube resolution pretty much. It's not bad, it's a lot of data. And this is how the distribution looks like in a, in a real plasma. This is data. In one point, the plasma is like, it looks more like a, a distribution function looks like more like a vortex with a multiple beams and something like, like it's spinning. You see, this is a cut with two, three beams, multiple anisotropies. There is anisotropy in the core and in the beam. Something that we really don't understand fully yet what is happening. This is in a single point and it's varying. Indeed, the, now, we are doing a movie, finally, a movie with the observations. This is real data. You can almost hear in the wind flowing <laughs> through your probe. And while it flows, is measuring the velocity distribution function, which has, has a lot of different. There are, you see, there are regions where it becomes crazy. With beams, uh, crescents like, then it becomes more quiet. Then, uh, like, then you have also pancake-like distributions. You have also like um, hazelnut <laughs> distributions. You have like, uh, uh, what's the? Um, torus-like distributions, ring-like. You, you have a really a variety of structures in the velocity space. It's, it's like your distribution function is free to evolve in this phase space, uh, steered by turbulence, something really uh, novel. And then uh, we thought, how can we describe this velocity distribution function? This is a new aspect of turbulence. We don't have turbulence just in the physical space. We have turbulence also in the velocity space. So imagine about something about that. Uh, to do that, we went back to the 40s, <laughs> of course, and there is a lot, giant literature on this. Most of this literature is on uh, gyrokinetics. Pe people in gyrokinetics really love the Hermit projection. Uh, we thought to capture fluctuation in the velocity space, we can use Hermit and Hermit basis. We can decouple the, our distribution function by using a orthonormal projection with their Hermit basis. It's similar to what we do in the physical space with Fourier. Hermit is my new Fourier, okay? And uh, what we observed for the first time is that if you project your velocity distribution function with Hermit modes, you can, again, my M is like the wave numbers for, uh, for the, is like my K vector. In each point, you can project your distribution function and measure the fluctuation in the velocity space. And what we observed is that uh, there is a power law. Mode zero is the density. M equal one is the bulk flow. M equal two 
is the temperature. M equal three is related to the heat flux. Each M is related to the order in the closure of the fluid moment, which is beautiful if you think about uh, a tokamak plasma because people like have multi-fluid models with a lot of moments in tokamaks, for example, if you want to do simulations. And uh, here is a real plasma and we are measuring the mid spectrum and it has a nice power low here. And we were very puzzled about this. So since we, I really lo love Kolmogorov, we went back to the Boltzmann equation and make the three assumptions of Kolmogorov, one about the transfer rate, which is constant, characteristic scales and some conservation laws. That's what you need to do Kolmogorov, three things. You do this and we obtain P2 minus M3 halves, if is uh, the electric field dominating or M2 equal minus two, if it's really magnetized. We, we had this uh, very qualitative uh, prediction for the spectrum. Indeed, uh, this one M2 minus three halves is the, is the one we observe in the data in different regimes. This is M minus three halves. And this is simulations from different groups that they obtained this either one or the other, depending on the time scales, you can flip to sort of like a Kolmogoro phenomenology. So really the energy is flowing. Where are we staying now in research in this field? The energy is flowing from large scales in the velocity space and in the physical space to small scales in this new phase space. It's a phase space cascade, we imagine. Oh, if it were the Gaussian, uh -huh. time will expand in, in this Hermit model. Zero, oh. no Hermit. Uh, M equals zero. Uh, for how it's defined, is everything is M equals zero. It's not, so there is no phase space turbulence for MHD. Okay, that's really to make it. The, and the, your epsilon is the integral of all these modes because epsilon it has the is by definition the integral of all this ener extra energy, free energy. Okay, is energy in the velocity space. So this is my take home message for the. I think uh, no, I didn't finish. I have time yet, right? Yes, I have it. So for the second part, uh, I have a, we, we can say that magnetic reconnection uh, emerges locally in turbulence. And we, we started with MHD because it's really well behaves. It gives a nice pattern and we can go to very high resolutions. Locally, it is occurring. We don't know how locally these reconnection, reconnecting sites are uh, like stable. They can disappear. They can produce secondary tearing, for example. And it, sometimes it appears. If you have very high resolution, some of this tearing produce eye tearing like locally for a little bit, they vanish. You have to follow them with a camera and you can see that they produce a secondary islands, but then they get absorbed in this mess, which is turbulence. Okay, it's very chaotic. Um, we had to make contact with reality with this virtual spacecraft because we want to use our simulation to understand real data. So we fly through this uh, so through the simulation and we verified one simple thing is that for if you fly through turbulence you measure only gradients of the magnetic field that's what you can do from a single spacecraft if you have multiple spacecraft then you can do multiple like direction currents but from a single spacecraft close to the sun for example you can just measure gradients these gradients are broadly distributed like in the simulation the strongest one have all the nice properties of reconnection so probably Reconnection are like magnetic uh, uh, discontinuities are reconnecting sites, all of them probably. Uh, some of them are more uh, more strong, some of them are more steady state, some of them are like more flashy, you know, they disappear there, small, uh, they have small reconnection rates. Um, if you want to understand more, then you have to go to the kinetic, do the analogous with the kinetic simulation. So you will see that you are not producing only shears of a magnetic field in turbulence, but you are producing temperature and isotropy local to the current shield with thanks to the Vlasov uh, support from simulations. Um, but moreover, very recently, we discovered that really you don't produce just an isotropy, but your distribution function produce all the possible corrections in a sort of like cascade in this phase space. So in this part, uh, I, I anticipate a little bit the last part of since I have like 10 minutes, I will anticipate the a little bit last part of my lectures where we will now uh, we understood a little bit a little bit what is happening in turbulence by means of eulerian simulations and eulerian simulations are very good when you want to describe temperature or correction in the thermal region of your velocity distribution function so if your velocity distribution function and you take a cut here is something like 
this, fine. Your, your Maxwell Eulerian code can describe this and can describe all the fluctuation in this velocity space. This is f of v. But if you want to look at electrons and you want to look at the really want to drive your system very hard, or you want to study your, the same system, probably more in a compact object, for example, or in a supernova remnants. Uh, if you have a high tails in the velocity distribution function, then you will have, a, your VDF will produce very, very peaked distribution here. If it, it, your, your VDF will produce high tails if you accelerate particles. And therefore, if you want to study, study acceleration of particles, the Eulerian simulation are not the best. You want to do it with a Lagrangian way. So we repeated the same experiments with the other technique we introduced this morning. Instead of doing Eulerian blast, we repeated exactly the same with uh, uh, peak codes to see what happens to particles. If they are accelerated or where they are accelerated. And, uh, and uh, we did look at diffusion and acceleration of, of particles in a turbulent regime that is like solar windish, like solar wind. Uh, like in the in the parameter setting of the solar wind, um, but then uh, there is another important uh, property of the wind, as we saw this morning. The wind is flowing; it's not going like free in your heliosphere. It encounters objects like our plasma sphere, right, uh, magnetosphere. So there are there are these obstacles, and interaction with these obstacles produces shocks. Or when a supernova remnant explodes, for example. It has turbulence around. So you see now one particular feature which is common to all of these systems is the interaction of turbulence with shocks. That's the last, the second part of this, uh, of this uh, sequence of lectures that we will, uh, we will uh, uh, introduce. We will, uh, the idea is to uh, study shocks, not only like the typical ranking Yugunyot conditions, but having a nice shock and uh, shouting like turbulence against it, like, like sending a turbulent field against a shock with MHD and with, uh, especially with kinetic models. That's a, that was the motivating question. Why do we always study shocks with like nice MHD global codes, but locally we see something strange. What is happening when you study the interaction of a shock like the heliospheric boundary layer with the surrounding medium? This uh, actually, this starts from a, uh, was very ins like inspired by a work by Gary Zank, where he was drawing some cartoon uh, of a shock interacting with uh, uh, little vortices that go against the shock. What do they do to particles? This work was mostly on diffusive particle acceleration. It's very, very well known, except uh, till two years ago, nobody did it with a self-consistent kinetic code. You have to, Build, think about a strategy. Uh, I have a shock and I want to send, first I want to see the effect of a shock on particles as it, as it stands alone. Okay, I have a smooth shock, it goes away, it accelerates particles. We know this with drifting acceleration or many mechanisms, like um, can be uh, many Fermi-like mechanisms. Then uh, I send like 1% turbulence. Then I send 10% turbulence. Then I send 100% turbulence. What's the difference? when I do these experiments. It's a, a, a thought experiment, you do it first, but we did it with the kinetic physics. And we observed some analogies again, then we established analogies with the observation. In the last part, I will uh, speak about something I'm working more actively now with like supernova remnants that explode and interact with a shock, um, or the problem of a dynamo. This is a, Actually, even four years ago, we were speaking about probability of generating magnetic field from shears. I was very puzzled to, into the 2018 meeting here at the press previous school about possibilities of producing magnetic fields. Um, it was a nice talk by Professor Majan. And boy, there, is an, there was another talk on production and the role of shears on dynamo-like problem. What I was thinking about is, uh, what if we do the same experiment, but with a collisionless plasma? Imagine you, uh, we study turbulence with zero magnetic field and we initiate at this turbulent motion. What happens in time with zero magnetic field? If you do it with MHD, if you don't have a seed, you will never produce magnetic field. There is a theorem. You can see it from equations, actually, that uh, if you don't have a seed of a magnetic field, 
you never produce, produce it. This is very common to people that do laser plasma interactions. Uh, they see production of a magnetic field when they, they, produce, they send a beam of particles on a target. They produce magnetic field in a collisionless way. We will do the same with, by using turbulence. And finally, I, produced a, I, I built up a, a group in my University of Calabria where we match all of this that we were speaking about before with the compact, ob compact objects. We have simulations of black holes. We will show you some at the last part, some simulation of black holes dynamics, uh, collision of black holes first in vacuum. And now we are adding like studying plasma physics when in the neighbors of the horizon event. So, okay, okay. In the, in the vicinity of black holes, we do local simulation of turbulence with highly relativistic plasmas. So that will be uh, pretty much the, 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 the way we will abandon. I, I think I have a few minutes. I don't know if I can, I can stop it here because 45 minutes. Yes, yes, question time. Thank you. Oh, okay. I have a question. Uh, okay, so um, you can forgive me for asking this question. Okay. So I'm scared now. <laughs> My intention is that once you go past magnetohydrodynamics, high dynamics, the concept of reconnection makes no sense. Mm. It's, it's a totally stupid concept. Okay. After that. Mm. Because what is reconnecting in what fluid? The moment you add sufficient vorticity in the ion question, all right, uh, B is no longer frozen in V. Absolutely. What is frozen is V plus current. You mean like about relativistic regimes? And you go to the electron motion, you give it some velocity. Electron speed is not the fluid speed. No, not it at is all. different from the current. Mm -hmm. So either the current and the, the uh, your uh, physical quantity, which is to be frozen in the, in the fluid, mm -hmm. is not V. No. Okay. Or the... the the fluid in which it's getting frozen has no well-defined ah, physical velocity. Absolutely. So what the hell is reconnecting with what? Yes, sir. Like okay. Alexian himself said this in last year of his uh, years of his life that uh, magnetic field lines don't exist according to him. No, no, no. But that's a different thing. Of course, magnetic field lines don't exist. But let's assume this is a ma is matter of scales. Yes. So the question is, one should really eliminate. Uh, reconnection into these things and analytics, and it's the energy exchange process. Oh, sure. You can write down dv squared dt, dv squared dt, dt, dt. Yes. All right. Yeah. And you can really talk about these things totally independent of the totally absurd concept of reconnection. We, we did it, but but in the nice accident, and this is, I'm sorry, now you to repeat this to you, that, that nice accident is that if you do this, if you measure the transfer rate of energy, is occurring nearby this current sheet that probably are reconnecting one. Current sheet on the yeah. step, but they needn't be moving with any physically relevant speed. Okay. So that's the whole point here is what is really happening is that there are three or four forms of energy, I suppose. Uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Magnetic, uh, thermal, and kinetic. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And one can write a fully self consistent system in three energy evolution equations. Okay. It's, it's fluid, like, but then re reconnection, according to me, really introduces extremely strange concepts which can misguide you into the interpretation of data. Okay. Right? Well, it's, a, it's a topological concept. It's a topological concept. No, no, that, that's because, the point. Uh, you uh, needn't have any change in topology and still yeah. have energy yeah. scales. No, no. So, so, so the whole point is that we have to go away from the language of pure MSP. Because it makes no sense further. Anytime but, you have kinetic effect, anytime you have fast particle, anytime you have the velocity field you have long, look at the amount of vorticity it will have. Yeah, but careful because with MHD you lose the main ingredient of that. No, no, that's the divergence of the electric field. The key number of effects mm -hmm. which will make the concept of reconnection somewhat meaningless. And you're imposing it on, uh, you know, energy exchanges we understand. Yeah. The version of one form of energy to another, we do understand. And they can take place absolutely without any so-called uh, change in topology. 
Topology of change can take place, nobody is talking about it, but it cannot be the conventional notion of interaction. But you have seen so far that at X point, you have X point and there is happening in the connection by definition. You have seen that this is a topological constraint and creates local, local patterns where there is an energy production, energy exchange. Now with your language, this locally, the reconnection is, these are active region of energy conversion. No, I can say that there is a local region yeah. where the tendency for the magnetic energy to be converted to, uh, to kinetic energy Excellent. is Absolute. larger. Because that's what happens in the homogeneous system. There will be different regions. Yeah, yeah. And these guys are exchanging energy. But I don't see contrast to, to mm. what, I don't see any contrast to what we have just no, seen, no, right? No, 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 not to your results. It's an interpretation of okay. the See, the, the, the point is, why bring reconnection? And it has been a 70 year industry. <laughs> yes, okay? yes, I have. Still nobody understand anything about it. So what you do is you take the MST notion, then you say, well, you kinetic effect field, but the kinetic things are destroying the entire uh, reconnection concept. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So the point is that why don't we move away from the language of reconnection? It's, uh, it's semantic. I do, they, they don't you think it's semantic? semantic. As, this is... uh, Daniel pointed out, it points out to a very well defined process mm -hmm. of topological change. It may or may not happen. Mm -hmm. okay. right? So uh, I don't mean to proceed. No, 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 no. I mean, this is, this is very, it's, it's the point of my talk, actually. It's good. The of uh, some of the uh, younger people. Sure. That, that maybe that they should um, um, question when they use the conventional language. Mm -hmm. Because it could lead to concepts which are not mm -hmm. very difficult to define, especially if you go to the linguistic class. Oh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure. For, that, yes, for sure. That's yeah. that's another story. Yep, sir. Yeah. I think it's a nice reflection for a basic question there and, and then Yeah. Um, so, um, the I just want to understand, the, uh, in reconnection, uh, there is a, a current sheet formation. Yeah. So what happens before? The lines reconnect, then the current uh, sheet formation takes place, or it is vice versa? Uh, it's, uh, they come together, and as you can see, this, this region will squeeze. And by definition, you have to form a current layer, which everything I spoke about was about current sheet. Okay, just to, to keep in... Because uh, in the first experiment we did, we had the resistivity. It was MHD, and here J is sufficiently large. We have a, we have a strong Ohm electric field, okay, E, this, which is dissipative. Is that there is a peak there, and you can make all the sweet Parker like that's a black box, as we do it like in plasma courses with field lines that came in, flows that goes out. There is a budget of energy. Indeed, sweet Parker. Which is the reconnecting the picture of Sweet Parker? It's a conversion black box. It's a conversion box. It's a black box where magnetic field enters and goes out as bulk flows because particles are accelerated. There is a flow of velocity here. It's really a, a perfect conversion ma machine, but you need eta j. Now, the problem is that eta is zero in the universe, in the in the in the physical in the in the solar wind. But so your Ohm's law becomes like, of course, you have to keep like U cross B. This is the general Ohm's law. Then plus the whole term. And then there is a magic term here. There is one term that many people, they overlooked in the past years, and that was bad, that make the concept of reconnection obsolete. Yes. And it's the divergence of the pressure. Precisely. This is my favorite <laughs> because it's like, People that do fluids, they forget about this. Don't do it because <laughs> because this is the divergence of pressure here. It can have a strong component, you see, parallel to the magnetic field. They can really break field lines. Let's call it reconnect or rematching field lines or converting energy. Okay. This, this tensor is not isotropic. Not at all. It's absurdly not isotropic. <laughs> and then we have like. All the terms like on the order of DE, so they have divergence of current. There is a yes, yes, yes. But this one we measure that emissions. This is ready to do everything I said this morning. And uh, if you measure this, is like my sort of like proportional to my epsilon. 
because it's like it has an isotropy in and can really do adds the probably is the most the largest one in the magneto sheath and solar wind. So right. uh, this has a lot of uh, effects. There is another question. Uh, yeah. well, we want to do local magnetic detection and continue with that if the magnetic island evolved now sweet part of magnetic mm -hmm. well, for MHD. Okay. Only for MHD. Okay. Statistic Absolutely. Yeah. What about the linear FTR phase and the nonlinear Rutherford phase? We went crazy on this point. I anticipate you. I know your question is a, 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 a excellent question. People would expect that you see all the tearing mode, the tearing linear phase. We don't. That part is completely eaten, destroyed by turbulence because the characteristic time of the tail of the tearing is on the order of nonlinear time. So if you, these vortices are shaking with a frequency which is higher than that characteristic time. So that part is canceled, is useless. <laughs> I will say that yeah, although it's a good, exact, it's a beautiful example I do in my courses again in plasma. I spend hours and hours to do the tearing because we need to do calculations. But in the, uh, our numerical experiments is gone. Okay, one more thing. You keep one localized then what um, satellite is to evolve life to switch over. Okay, the point is, what about the neighboring magnetic island? Because mm -hmm. there may be the island overlapping and the stock has transition. Mm -hmm. about... Most of them are like uh, in a crowd of reconnecting, which is not steady state. And the value of the reconnecting, the recon this reconnection rate is almost zero because they are too flashy. They appear and disappear. They are not steady state. And it's so low that you didn't see it in that plot. I was selecting the strongest one for the strongest one. That's all. But why are we interested in the strongest one? Because the strongest one has a very nice topology. And this topology is important because we can identify in space data and we can see these structures here to be very active for particle acceleration. Then there is like 90% of like quiet, unstable, secondary. <laughs> silent reconnecting like mud okay any last question there oh, so magnetic reconnection is associated with the solar ic vector also okay so this, is, sorry, so this means the magnetic energy is converted into so energy of oh that's another really that's really a an homogeneous pattern you are a cme it's a very large scale or a cusp on the sun, it's a very large scale an homogeneity. We are not describing that. We are studying homogeneous turbulence. That's a singular. I, 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 I okay. Ask, what do you think? Magnetic reconnection is always associated with the ejection of mass. Oh, but people, uh, there is a big question on this. Maybe not all the, of the time. There are other effects like vortex productions locally that can trigger and break the field lines. Um, to me, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's another problem. It's like uh, extreme events, very large scale, extreme singular events. This is more, I mean, uh, uh, it's more present in homogeneous turbulence. That's like extreme events. Um, yeah, reconnection, of course, three dimensional. Then you have to go to the 3D reconnecting world where like you have kind of spines, null points, reconnection. That's a completely different topology than this. So really, I don't know what is happening there from the kinetic point of view, but it will be interesting to see. Oh, yeah. All right. Just uh, those phenomena may be much more uh, in the category of what are called the catastrophic phenomena. Mm. Mm. due to slow radiation that changes, mm. and then it gets to a stage where that it becomes more possible and it explodes. Mm. So the cataclysmic events are very different from what this time. Oh, this time. Will 
You take note of the exercise. Working? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Can you hear me well like this? Sorry. Yes. You're yes. Uh, and okay. the pointer is. Professor Lina Ali from the Fall Polytechnic. Not a professor, but <laughs> he can just say that. <laughs> From the Cal Polytechnic, and she will follow well, the title of the reaction. This will be her first lesson. Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel. The pointer is not working, or okay. is it this the one? Was, she yeah, it was, yes, it is. Uh, you how? Point, no, no, you have to point on the other Ah, way. okay, it Great. works on. Oh, okay, Great. perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, and thank you again, uh, Professor Swadesh and Professor Daniel, for this invitation. I'm very, very honored to be here. It's actually my first time to be to attend ICTP and also to give a, a kind of um, courses in a, a school. So I'm I'm very happy and I'm very honored. Uh, so uh, for my courses or the talks, so I will be more speaking about uh, in situ observations, fields using fields and particles data in space plasma. And uh, basically, so from the title, it's a bit different from what is actually on the schedule. So it's, uh, I will describe you or present you some of the underlying processes uh, that play uh, an important role actually in the solar wind magnetospheric uh, uh, coupling. Um, and basically I will uh, show you uh, uh, some examples using, or some example of studies using uh, uh, space uh, observations. And uh, during the talks, I will show you some results. And uh, this, these studies or results, of course, uh, were done with uh, huge collaborations with my colleagues uh, and well, many, many uh, collaborations. Um, so uh, so uh, I will be, uh, so the course will be split into three parts. In the first part, I will just describe you how do we observe actually space plasma? Because, well, uh, uh, Sergio presented as well some solar wind observations, uh, but how do we make actually these observations? And uh, the second part, I will uh, talk about an example of an underlying processes in the solar wind, which is turbulence. And well, uh, Sergio uh, presented or talked about turbulence more on the kinetic scales, but I will uh, uh, talk more of the turbulence properties at the MHD scales or the large scale. And the last part, uh, I will talk more about planetary ionospheres, actually focusing on Saturn's uh, ionosphere, because it's a very particular one. Uh, it actually interacts with the rings of Saturn's as well. So it's very different from Earth uh, or other planetary ionospheres. Um, okay, so, uh, and actually for, so I will start now with the first part. How do we observe space uh, plasmas? And as you uh, know, uh, uh, well, they are um, uh, in space or in the universe, or if we take the solar wind, it got, covers a large uh, range of parameters and wavelengths and energies. So we cannot have, it's very difficult to build one instrument that will cover full range of frequencies or full range of wavelength. And that's why uh, when we develop spacecraft missions, we need to put many different instruments Sometimes these instruments, they measure the same quantity. So uh, I will present you today different kind of instruments that will be able to measure the electron number densities. And that's very important because we need to have independent measurements of the same quantity, uh, but also we need to have complementary uh, measurements to cover the full range, let's say, of the frequencies. Um, uh, so for the first part, uh, and please interrupt me uh, when you have any questions. So as you all know, uh, the plasma, uh, it uh, makes up over 99% of the, visi the visible matter of the universe. And here I just like actually to show you this uh, very recent image taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, 
which uh, the so-called the pillars of the creation actually and this was measured uh, using uv light and you see here these are uh, uh, the columns of uh, dust there's also gas and there's also plasmas uh, so this is in the interstellar medium and closer to us in uh, uh, in the solar system of course we have our star the sun and here, which emits continuously this non-collisional uh, plasma, which uh, we call the solar wind. So what's the name of this monster? This one? In the universe. In, it, it looks like a monster. This one? Yes. <laughs> Three monsters. <laughs> it's like, actually, it's like uh, horses, I think, is uh, related to horses. Dinosaur. Or dinosaur, if you want. <laughs> And actually, this uh, uh, the first image of this uh, uh, nebula was uh, uh, taken actually in the early 90s, in 1995, by the father of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is Hubble Space Telescope. Well, I could have shown you the differences, but uh, you can see it online. <laughs> um, okay, so how do we observe, how do we make measurements of the plasma in space? So there are two kinds of measurements. You will hear uh, 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 speaking of remote sensing uh, measurements. And this is uh, basically, we make the measurements uh, uh, so uh, distantly, remotely. And these remote sensing uh, uh, techniques, it helps uh, getting the general, basically the general and the global properties of the system or the object uh, that we are uh, measuring. And uh, remote sensing instruments or, or uh, measurements are extremely important because, of course, the interstellar medium so far we could we cannot measure it in situ yet. So, uh, remote sensing instruments are very uh, uh, important and complementary to the second type of the uh, uh, measurements, which is the in situ measurements. Why do we call them in situ? For instance, if we take the solar wind, we um, consider the solar wind as a perfect laboratory actually for studying collisionless plasma. And in laboratory, we make in situ measurements actually. So that's why we call in situ measure. We directly measure uh, uh, the properties of uh, the plasma uh, uh, locally. Uh, 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 so at the location of the uh, uh, spacecraft. And from the in situ measurement, we can get much more details um, uh, measurements or uh, get the plasma parameters, for instance, the electric field, the magnetic field, and the electron number densities or the ion number densities, and so on, that we can use uh, in the uh, equations and so uh, study the different uh, processes that we are interested in. So I won't have the time in one hour actually to speak about all kind of remote sensing uh, 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 um, measurements and all kind of in situ uh, instruments. But I will uh, present you a few examples of remote sensing techniques and also a few examples of remote uh, of in situ uh, techniques or in situ instruments uh, uh, to do the measurements or the observations. Okay, so uh, regarding the remote sensing uh, observations, uh, of course, uh, one of the most famous uh, instruments are the imagers. So uh, the images are very uh, important because, well, we can get uh, the images of the objects that uh, we want to study. And here, I, I really wanted to show you this example of an image of the uh, uh, Saturn taken by the Cassini spacecraft. And it's actually one of my favorite images taken by Cassini of Saturn. So Cassini was a NASA mission. Uh, it was, uh, uh, well, uh, built to explore Saturn's and its environment and its moons. It was launched in 1997, arrived to Saturn in 2004, and then ended a couple of years ago in 2017. And this is a very nice image because it, so this Saturn uh, was imaged behind, uh, so the sun is behind uh, the plane, and uh, Saturn was in the night side and took this beautiful, spectacular image of the planet. So you can see the planet, its uh, rings around uh, the planets. And uh, also you can note, so here we are at the night side observing Saturn, but you can see some lights uh, in the Northern hemisphere on uh, uh, the surface of the planet. And this is actually the reflected lights from the rings onto the surface of uh, the planet. 
so you can see here, uh, as I said, uh, the rings. I will talk about uh, a bit more the rings of Saturn uh, tomorrow. But you can see this kind of bluish um, uh, ring uh, around uh, 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 the planet. And that's actually the E ring. And the E ring is very particular because it's made of uh, uh, so plasma and dust particles generated from one of the icy moons of uh, Saturn, which is called Enceladus. And you can see here uh, a dot, uh, and this is actually the moon. And we discovered with Cassini that this moon ejects continuously uh, charged dust and uh, uh, organic materials and water. And while it's orbiting around the planet, it will form uh, this kind of nice uh, ring. And we call it E-ring because of the name Enceladus for E. Uh, okay, so I just, so this is, I open a parenthesis. I just want to show you. So this is uh, also another image uh, taken by Cassini. Uh, one of the clearest images actually taken of Cassini of the moon. Uh, this is uh, Enceladus. It's a nicey moon. And uh, mostly water. Yes, is uh, uh, water. And with Cassini, so this is also uh, uh, a set of images taken from Cassini. And you can see here the water jet emitted from the southern pole of uh, uh, the moon. And uh, in the southern pole, actually, it is characterized by this kind of structures, which is known as the tiger stripes, actually. And the water is emitted uh, from these uh, tiger stripes. And how these moons actually were, uh, how these water plumes was actually discovered, it's, um, it was discovered in situ uh, using uh, from the magnetic field uh, data. So actually the first flyby of uh, uh, Enceladus was in 2005. And Cassini flew about 1,000 kilometers above uh, 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 moon, the moon. And from the magnetic field data, I mean, this uh, water plume was discovered accidentally because in this plot here, you see these first three panels are the, uh, the three different components of the magnetic field. And this is the last panel is the magnitude of the magnetic field. And you can see at this specific time, there is a sharp uh, gradient or a change in the different components of the magnetic field. And it's like, uh, 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 I mean, a different kind of variations that we observe if we cross a comet, a tail of a comet or, and is it, is it yes, so this is real. Yeah. And here the team, I mean, the, the, the MAG team, at uh, 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 in 2005, they said, okay, there is something going on around this moon. We really need to get closer to this moon to really see what is going on. Why do we have this change in the magnetic field? And here they talked with the project scientists of the mission and it was kind of very uh, difficult. I mean, we cannot change the orbits of the mission uh, like this. And they uh, decided, okay, uh, let's make few flybys, closer flybys to this moon and look closely what is going on. And here, uh, and during the second flyby, Cassini flew uh, about 175 kilometers closer to the moon, and they discovered actually these uh, impressive, I mean, water jets uh, emitted. And also, I mean, I'm not showing it here, but they also discovered uh, from the ion mass spectrometer, I will talk about how do we do measurements from the ion mass spectrometer. They also observed the presence of organic molecules. They also observed heating or uh, some heat uh, around uh, these uh, uh, tiger stripes. So basically, they found the conditions uh, to uh, 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 potential conditions to have life actually uh, uh, in this uh, 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 region. So there is heat, potential energy, there is uh, uh, organic molecules, and there is water. And now there are uh, future missions actually, uh, a NASA mission called Europa Clipper mission. Maybe you have heard about it. It will be launched in 2004. And the aim of this mission, Europa Clipper, is to fly by. So there are other icy moons uh, in, uh, in the solar system, basically as well around Jupiter. So there is Europa, is an icy moon. And Europa Clipper, it aims to make, uh, uh, it's an orbiter around uh, Europa to actually uh, study uh, this uh, uh, kind of the ocean that lies underneath the, the surface of uh, the moon. And also there is another European mission, it's called JUICE for Jupiter icy moons explorer. And also it will, uh, one of the main uh, objectives of this mission is to study the habitability of the icy moons of, uh, at Jupiter and also the coupling 
it's a dynamic coupling between Jupiter, the gas giants, and its icy moons around it. Is it true uh, that most of the exoplanets that one is discovering, they have, they're much more watery than Earth? Uh, I, I, I mean, I've read, yeah, something, yes. I mean, I don't really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite amazing. Yes, and actually, after this discovery of Enceladus, uh, there was also many other discoveries of icy moons in our solar system where there is a notion. And actually here, uh, wh why do we observe this? I mean, um, uh, uh, this ocean is a salty ocean as well. There is salt in this uh, ocean. So it's very, yes, it's very uh, impressive. So we yeah. have to think of what it is like rather than calling Earth this planet. Yes, yeah, yeah. So actually, and Cassini is maybe one of the first missions that aims to answer these grand questions in the universe. Are we alone uh, in the universe or is there any life uh, on other planets or other objects in the solar system? Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I mean, I, I will close this parenthesis uh, talking about uh, Enceladus and Saturn, but this is just to show you so the images uh, uh, as one of the remote sensing uh, uh, techniques. Another uh, remote sensing technique is a spectroscopy. And with spectroscopy, as you know, we will measure the spectrum of the electromagnetic radiations well, including the visible light, infrared, UV, X-rays, and so on, and that radiates from the stars or uh, uh, the objects that we are measuring. And from the spectrum, uh, we can uh, actually know uh, the uh, ion composition, the chemical composition, the temperature, or uh, the density. And I will show you here an example of uh, 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 measurements uh, actually done in December 2012 uh, by the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, who image uh, for the first time, this is the Europa icy moons around Jupiter. The first three panels are Europa in the visible light, and the other panels, panels are Europa in the UV uh, 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 light. And uh, uh, the, the second panel here is the uh, hydrogen uh, Lyman alpha uh, line. So, and the second, the last one is oxygen. And from these spectroscopic measurements, you could see that near the southern pole of Europa, there is uh, also a kind of the presence of uh, emissions uh, from the oxygen lines and the hydrogen lines. And these were the first evidences of water also uh, 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 vapor emitted from uh, uh, these moons. And it was first discovered using this spectroscopy uh, technique. Uh, yeah, and as I said, the Europa Clipper mesh, uh, mission will uh, perform uh, many flybys around this moon actually to see uh, uh, if actually uh, these water plumes still exist or uh, there's no water anymore ejected from uh, the subsurface of the moon. Uh, okay, also another way to, uh, another measurements that we do remotely is the magnetic fields. Uh, so we can also do magnetic field measurements uh, uh, remotely, and this is based on uh, uh, the Zeeman effect. So uh, as you may know, the Zeeman effect, so is the effect by, of the splitting of the uh, spectral lines into several components. Uh, actually in the presence of uh, uh, magnetic fields. And it was first observed uh, by the Dutch physicist, well, Peter Zeeman in, uh, in 1896, while doing uh, uh, experimentary, uh, uh, laboratory experiments. And um, uh, so this is here uh, just, uh, well, an illustration of the splitting of these spectral lines uh, in, in different components. So if we don't have a magnetic fields, we don't have any, well, uh, shift in the energy. We don't have any split. But in the presence of a uh, uh, magnetic field, we observe a broadening of the spectra. Or if the magnetic field is very strong, we observe a splitting in, in the spectral line. And here, why does it, I mean, here is a kind of the formula that ex, uh, expresses the, well, the shifted frequency as a function of the unshifted frequency plus and uh, minus a term that depends on the magnetic fields. And here mu is uh, what we call the Bohr magneton, which basically the magnetic moment of the electrons um, 
which is caused by the spin or the orbital angular uh, momentum. And uh, yeah, so since it depends on the magnetic field, uh, from these kind of measurements, we can know the uh, magnitude of the magnetic field, but also the orientation of the magnetic field. Uh, so this is here an example, actually, of uh, an image uh, of uh, a sunspot. So this is uh, in black, you see uh, uh, the sunspot, and the sunspots are regions on the sun which are characterized by very strong uh, magnetic field. Why it's black because the temperature of the sunspot is much lower than uh, the rest of the surface of the sun, and uh, well, uh, but it's still very high temperature. Uh, and if we take, if we measure the spectral line uh, along this line here that crosses the sunspot, but other region around the sunspot, and if we look at the spectrum, you see that in this region that lies just inside the sunspot we clearly see a broadening of the spectrum and here a very uh, clear uh, splitting uh, uh, with the three different spectral lines. And that's because of the presence of this magnetic field. However, above this region and below, we still have a magnetic field, but the magnitude is, is much uh, uh, less. And we only observe just the broadening of the uh, magnetic field. Now, from these kind of measurements, and actually, that's how uh, we can measure the magnetic field of other stars, for instance, or our exoplanets, uh, uh, because we cannot uh, measure them. We cannot go there yet and measure them in situ with magnetometers. Uh, anomalous? There is yeah. more, uh, there are two kinds of two manifests. One is okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also with the anomalous uh, Zeeman effect, we can observe. Uh... But in case of anomalous, uh, you mentioned, I think we have uh, three sets of uh, splitting. Yeah. Uh, six uh, lines, I guess. Uh, okay. I don't want to answer something wrong. Okay. But I, I, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, we can observe this as well with the anomalous uh, human effect. But how, I mean, what's the difference exactly about in the observations? I cannot really so answer I you. Actually, like you were saying that, uh, with, uh, above and below this uh, the splitting level, uh, there are weak magnetic fields. So these are, uh, I'm, it, it just comes to my mind where weak magnetic fields are there. So, uh, so anomalous human effect may be a correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. And uh, then also, as I said, we can know the magnitude of the magnetic field. We can measure, but also we can uh, uh, also get an idea about the polarization of the light. And this depends on the orientation of the magnetic field with respect to the line of sight. If the magnetic field is perpendicular to the line of sight, then the uh, polarization of the uh, light is linear, and if it's the magnetic field is along the line of sight, then uh, the polarization will be circular. Uh, okay, so now I will move to the in situ kind of uh, observations, and here I will uh, also talk about different kind of instruments. Uh, 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 and before I uh, 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 do that. Uh, I just want to 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 say that, as as you all know, plasma physics is a very special field or particular field because it uh, it couples different fields in physics: electromagnetisms, fluid mechanics, and statistical physics. And uh, to be able to really study plasma physics, we really need to be able to measure all these quantities: the electric fields, the magnetic fields also uh, the particles uh, 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 moments uh, and the, uh, the velocities, the uh, position as well, and the densities and so on, and the charge density. And that's why we need to have in situ measurements. They are necessary to be able to, uh, to, to measure all these quantities and then use them in the equations and compare uh, or to apply the theory actually that we know in uh, the observations. And the first instrument I would like to talk about is the Langmuir probe. Now, uh, the Langmuir probe, it helps, uh, well, it aims 
it, it makes actually active measurements in the plasma by perturbing uh, uh, the plasma. And it was first invited in uh, the 90s, in the 1920, uh, by uh, Irving Langmuir, that you see here, and to measure actually the electron plasma uh, densities and the electron temperature in very cold, low density uh, laboratory plasmas. And then eight years later, the term plasma actually was kind of coined uh, to describe this partially ionized uh, gas. And I think, as far as I know, plasma, it comes from a Greek word, which, I mean, it doesn't, uh, it, has, it, it has nothing to do with the blood, but is, uh, is yes, it's more like a, gelat like a gelatin kind of, uh, Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's then why uh, 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 they use this word plasma. And then only actually uh, in the beginning of the 50s, where the Langley probes were start to be uh, mounted on board rockets and satellites to uh, measure the electron and the ion densities in the ionosphere of Earth, but also uh, uh, in space. Uh, but how uh, does it work? So here uh, I'm showing you uh, an example of, this is a Langmuir probe. It's a spherical probe. You can see here the probe. The diameter is about five centimeter. And this Langmuir probe was mounted on the Cassini spacecraft. You see here, this is an illustration. And I don't know if you can see, but in this circle, you see that the probes, uh, 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 yes, going outside from the spacecraft. And uh, we, it's always mounted well on a boom. Also, we want it to be away from the spacecraft so it's not affected by any kind of interferences uh, uh, from uh, the spacecraft. So uh, actually, the principle of uh, uh, working of the Langley probe is pretty easy. The Langley probe will measure uh, 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 the total uh, current as a function of the bias voltage that we apply to it. If we apply a positive voltage, the uh, Langley probe will collect uh, the uh, negative current, so the uh, electron current. And if we apply a negative voltage, then uh, the Langley probe will collect the uh, uh, ion current, the positive uh, 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 charged uh, uh, current. And from the char characteristic curve, actually, which we call the uh, current voltage curve, uh, we can uh, get to the properties of the plasma, the electron densities, the ion mass, the electron temperature, and so on. So the red curve here is uh, represents the total current collected by the Langley probe by sweeping along uh, different values of uh, 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 the voltage, so from negative to positive values. And this is uh, the total current, as I said, is a contribution of the electron current, which increases, as you can see here, for the positive values of the potential and also of uh, uh, a contribution from the ion uh, current, which is mainly dominant for the negative uh, uh, part of the potential. Yes. Uh, so normally when we plan a probe in the laboratory, we use a cylindrical probe. Yes. And here you're using a- uh, Spherical. Like, so, and normally the uh, Landau theory that we use to approximate, we assume a constant cross-section. So how does the cylindrical one, uh, the sphere one? Uh, also, we yes. Uh, like, uh, how does it compensate? Like, doesn't the theory deviate then? Uh, 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 current collection. No, I mean also for the spherical probe, we have uh, uh, a constant cross section of uh, and uh, uh, of uh, the probe. No, but when you take a cylindrical wire, it's constant throughout the length. And we assume uh, the Langley probe collection from the side. So that you break it, you get a circle. But in a sphere, actually, it becomes the radius. Yes. And so I just meant to ask can we use the same theory that we use for uh, normal cylindrical, or do you do some uh, expro approximation for this uh, curve? Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand uh, really the question, but uh, I, I think okay. It's okay. This will get on the set block. I mean, the current that we are measuring next to me. Yeah, but we, we can. I can. Uh, 
discuss this later on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, and uh, also, so we can demonstrate that the electron current, it actually depends on the electron number density. Here A is the surface area of, uh, of uh, uh, the probe, the spherical probe that we know. And uh, also on the electron uh, uh, temperature, and it's an exponential function actually, as a function of the bias potential and what we call the floating potential. What is the floating potential? The floating potential is where the potential of the probe, it balances the potential of uh, the ambient uh, plasma. And this also, the floating potential, we can see it in the measurements. I will show you that. And then also the uh, ion current also is as a function of parameters that we can measure or we can make assumption on them. And so uh, 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 we uh, 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 know the different parameters inside uh, 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 for the ion current. Now, I will show you, this was just an illustration, qualitative uh, uh, illustration of what is the total current look like uh, measured by uh, from the Langley probe. Uh, I don't know, it's very clear, but this, in this figure, these are real measurements from the uh, cassini langley probe. The first panel, so it's the current uh, and all of them as a function of the bias uh, potential, negative values and positive values here. Uh, these are the current here in uh, linear uh, space. The second panel is in logarithmic uh, uh, scale. So it's basically the same thing, but it's in logarithmic scale. And uh, the last part here is the derivative of the current versus uh, the bias potential. It's interesting to do this because this will allow us to observe any kind of variations in the current if we do uh, the derivative. And if we focus on um, the ion current, so the ion current is given by this uh, red curve here. How can we estimate, for instance, the ion densities and uh, uh, the ion mass uh, from this ion current? What we do? Well, simply we can fit this line. Well, the ion current uh, before that, we can uh, uh, reduce its form uh, uh, as a linear function. So we have, uh, it depends on the bias uh, uh, potential. B here is the slope of uh, uh, the line and plus m, which is the intercept at uh, uh, the current axis here. So if we fit this ion uh, current from the slope of this uh, line, uh, we uh, know b, this b, and b depends on the surface area, the ion charge, the ion number densities, qe is the, just the uh, charge of the electrons over uh, the uh, drift ion uh, uh, velocity and the ion mass. And the, then the intercept here is equal as well, also depends on the surface area, the ion charge, the ion number densities, and the drift velocity. Now, knowing the intercept, knowing the surface area of the probe, assuming a value, there's always assumptions, uh, uh, assuming the value of the, uh, the drift uh, velocity, we can estimate the ion velocity. Uh, the ion density, sorry. Now, from this estimation of the ion density, if we plug it into the slope value here, we can also get an estimate on the ion mass. And uh, also, now I didn't talk about the uh, electron parameters, but from uh, this exponential increase here, uh, and assuming in a Maxwellian distribution for the electrons, we can estimate the electron uh, temperature and also the electron number densities. Now, uh, I said in the beginning that uh, it's very important to have, uh, well, usually we always have uh, different kind of instruments that will make the same kind of measurements. So the Langley probe will give us an estimation of the ion number densities of the uh, electron number densities based on some assumptions that we do. But then we have other instruments such as ion uh, analyzers or electron analyzers that we also give estimates of the electron number densities and the ion number density. And by comparing both observations, we can cross calibrate uh, uh, the instrument and we can actually validate the observations from uh, the Langley probe. And uh, here just to, I mean, uh, from this derivative of the ion versus the voltage, 
we can also know uh, the value of the floating uh, potential because afterwards this uh, current saturates actually. Um, so that was uh, for the uh, Langley probe uh, 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 instruments and how we can identify or infer the ion number densities uh, and other parameters. Now I would like to talk about ion mass spectrometers. Now I, the ion mass spectrometers are spectrometers that will basically and mainly give us the ion composition uh, in the environment where we are making uh, well uh, the measurements. But how does this instrument work? How can we know the ion composition if we are measuring oxygen, uh, uh, helium plus or aluminum or iron? Basically by measuring uh, uh, the, the mass per charge ratio. And in addition to the mass per charge ratio, this instrument, it gives us the information uh, related to the direction of the ions. We know exactly the direction of the ions that we are measuring, measuring and the energy of these ions. Now, to show you an example of uh, an ion mass spectrometer, um, I will present you here uh, the ion mass spectrometer on board the Bepi Colombo mission, uh, which, I mean, this instrument is called MSA for mass spectrum analyzer. Uh, so just a few words about the Bepi Colombo mission. So this mission is a joint project between the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Japanese space agency, JAXA, and it aims to study in details. I will come back to that, to this in the end of uh, the talk today. Uh, it will aim to study in details using two probes, two orbiters, the uh, uh, Mercury's uh, as a planet, but also the magnetosphere, uh, the environment around uh, Mercury. And the, there is so one magnetospheric orbiter. This is the Japanese contribution and a planetary orbiter, which is the uh, European contribution. And the MSA, the mass spectrum analyzer, is on board the magnetospheric uh, orbiter. Uh, so this is the instrument. So it's quite big, actually. It's like 40 centimeters per 20 uh, centimeters. And it is mounted, so this is the magnetospheric orbiter. Uh, and is mounted off on one of the uh, uh, edges of this kind of octagon, actually. And uh, uh, here you see, actually, uh, I will detail this later on, uh, but uh, it consists mainly the, uh, uh, where we do the met where uh, the instrument collects the measurements of two parts. The first part is this one here, which is an electrostatic analyzer. And the second part, is the time of flight chamber. So it's a cylindrical chamber in which the mass per charge uh, uh, will be uh, identified. And here, the black region here are actually, so this is not empty, it's filled by uh, different windows. There are 32 windows actually from which uh, the positively charged ions will enter and will be collected. Uh, yeah, so this is just another image of the same instrument mounted so on uh, the magnetospheric orbiter, but covered by ceramics to protect it from the heat from the sun. And uh, also uh, uh, the windows here are uh, protected uh, by what MLI, what we call multi-layer uh, insulation, also to protect them from the heat of the sun. Is it like an electrostatic analyzer? Yes. Where like they will basically measure the, the energy per charge okay. yes okay. i will i will just talk about this but before <laughs> this is just an illustration here again so this is mercury this is just a, 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 a view from beside of the magnetospheric orbiter and this is the instrument here and these are the different windows or different sectors there are 32 and uh, uh, so, and each sector is about 11.25 degrees. So uh, 32 times this value, we have 30, 30, uh, 360 degrees. So we cover all the space. So we can measure the ions uh, uh, coming from uh, the different regions around the spacecraft. So how does this instrument work? Uh, this is an illustration of uh, 
uh, of the instrument. And you can see the instrument from uh, the inside, actually. So the first part is the electrostatic analyzer. Uh, and then the second part, as I said, is what we call a time of flight chamber. So what happens is that uh, we apply actually a varying potential here on this sphere uh, from about minus 2.2 volt up to minus uh, 5, 6 kilovolt. And this uh, uh, will, uh, to measure actually the positively charged ions with different energies. So with this instrument, we can detect the ions from about few electron volt up to 40 uh, uh, keV. So the incident ions will, uh, if we take an example of uh, here, uh, one window, so the incident ions will enter through these different windows. They will enter the electrostatic analyzer with a specific energy per charge. And at actually, why do you know why it is spherical? It's actually uh, we one of the reasons we make it spherical like this. Because you know the electric field shape on a spherical type. Yes, yes, but also because we need, uh, I mean, it can enter just directly, hits the detector below. Uh, in the bottom, but we wanted to have a spherical shape because we want, uh, uh, if there are photons actually that enters from the windows, they will hit the different walls. And only the uh, ions with the uh, specific energy per charge will continue its path down to the uh, detector below. So uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, electrostatic analyzer, we have it like a spherical uh, uh, shape uh, like this. Uh, so all the other like photons or other ions that enter, uh, if they don't have the correct uh, energy, they will just hit the wall and they will not be able to continue the path. And so at the exit of this uh, electrostatic analyzer, so the first pass is just to select the ions uh, uh, for specific energy per charge. At the exit here, we have uh, uh, an acceleration actually, a potential that will accelerate the ions towards a carbon foil. So this is an image what is actually uh, inside this region. So uh, uh, for each window, there is a kind of square here. And inside this square, there is a carbon foil and the ions will hit this uh, carbon foil. And uh, after hitting this carbon foil, they will enter the time of flight chamber and that's where the uh, time of flight of the ions will be measured. And so we can estimate the mass per charge of the ion. Now, when the positively charged ions hit this carbon foil, uh, they will interact with this carbon foil. So the positively charged uh, uh, ions, they will either uh, uh, lose an electron and uh, they will be positively charged inside uh, this um, time of flight chamber or they will gain an electron uh, uh, or uh, so they will leave as negatively charged or they will leave as a neutrals inside this time of flight chamber. And actually the particularity of this time of flight chamber is that uh, you see here, there are some different uh, um, uh, on the wall, like um, different like cylinders actually. And we apply actually a quadratic distribution uh, uh, of the potential along these walls. And this will give a linear electric field. And this role of this linear electric field is very important uh, because what, what will happen is that the positively charged ions will be, will be reflected. They will feel this electric field and they will be accelerated upward and detected here. The negatively charged ions, after they interact with the carbon foil, they will uh, be accelerated downward. And the neutrals, while well, they will not feel this electric field and they will be detected, well, they will go, what you say, straight through and also will be detected in the bottom, uh, 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 what we call micro channel plates. Now, how we calculate the time of flight? Uh, so once the, uh, 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 ions actually enters the time of flight uh, chamber, there is our secondary electrons emitted. 
And these secondary electrons will be detected uh, uh, in this part of the instrument here, and this will create a start uh, pulse or start signal. And then once uh, the ions will be detected upward in these NCPs or in the bottom NCPs, then we have a stop signals. And from the coincidences between each start and stop, we can calculate the time of flight. So it's a very complex, actually, uh, 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 how to say, to, to really uh, measure the time of flight of, uh, inside the time of flight chamber, but it works actually very well. Now, how from the time of flight, we estimate the mass per charge. What are the typical time scales? Nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. It's really, really quick. So uh, we so we we can sweep the full range of energies within nanoseconds as well. So so, tick, tick, so everything is really like. Uh, energy by magnetic There are there are yeah. other kind of mass spectrometers that have a magnetic field uh, kind of magnetometer inside. That's the bending mesh. Yes, but for this instrument, we don't have any. Yes. So, uh, then the, the ions are passing to the carbon coil. So, irrespective of what they become, like charge, negative, or neutral, they will always have an electron uh, emitted. Yes. Yes, always. Okay. And that's how. Uh, that's the charge. No. Means... This is uh, similar uh, how we say. Sim uh, for every uh, uh, um, interaction with the carbon foil, there is a secondary electron which is emitted. Uh, okay, so how do we estimate the mass per charge? It's, uh, I'm spending uh, maybe a time on this because it's very important. Because uh, when I was a student, well, I I wasn't when I was wondering actually how can we get the ion composition? How can we measure the uh, uh, electron densities? And I think it's very important to really understand how the instruments work because the instrument does not measure the ion composition like this, or that doesn't measure just the electron densities or the electron temperature. Uh, and actually it's, it's complex, but at the same time, the physics behind is very easy. So uh, let's talk about uh, the particles that are uh, detected uh, in this bottom detector that we call the straight through. So these ions are either the neutral or the negatively charged ion. So these ions, they will enter with an energy E0. Uh, and as I said, they will be accelerated here by a potential. So in addition to this E0, we have as well an electric potential force uh, uh, potential that we can add uh, uh, to it. And this will be equal to the kinetic uh, energy of uh, the uh, ions or uh, uh, the neutrals inside the time of flight chamber. So if we just uh, uh, write this formula, if we divide by Q, we get then the relation directly.